Hello, everybody. Good morning. It is 9.02. We're scheduled to start at 9. So everyone, let's uh, take your seats, and uh, we'll, we'll get this thing rolling. One thing I forgot to do, which is plug in HDMI. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, welcome back to Scaling Bitcoin Day 2. So, be honest, who went home last night and started planning for another fork just so they could try out Ethan's uh, wagering setup? Nobody? Okay. Um, so, today we're going we're gonna to be covering uh, a few more things. We're going to be talking about Layer 2. We're going to be talking about fees. Um, we're going to be talking about consensus. And to get us started today, we have uh, a very special guest, uh, Joey Ito, who's the director of the MIT Media Lab. And he's going to be talking to us about complex systems, about parallels with the internet, about communities, about ICOs. Uh, he's he's going to cover a lot of ground. Joey. Thanks, Thanks Dan. Um, <clears throat> so, I think everybody knows what the Media Lab is, so I'm not going to go um, and describe it. So <clears throat> I'm the director of the Media Lab and um, was involved in uh, getting the digital currency uh, initiative going. Um, and you know, I, I'm trying to keep up with what's going on, but I'm not in the details as much as everybody else. But I've been doing this since uh, we set up a DigiCash server in the 90s, so it feels like we've been doing this for a long time. Um, but <clears throat> let me try to frame a few ideas and see how we can plug in some of the things that you guys are probably working on. Um, so one thing that I think a lot about 
is complex adaptive systems, um, complex self-adaptive systems. So if you think about uh, how our environment works, so you have, you know, roughly, although it's changing now, uh, stable uh, temperature at sort of a global level. You, our body temperatures tend to be roughly around the right same temperature when we're in a healthy state. But at different layers, you have a lot of complexity, a lot of change, you have you know, species collapses, you have protocol changes. But what's interesting about complex self-adaptive systems is if, they're, uh, if they've evolved properly is that they can sustain quite a bit of change um, but retain uh, a lot of resilience by uh, adapting to things as they change. And if you think about how uh, the, our current um, Earth has evolved, I mean, there was a period, there's a point in history, for instance, when a mutation occurred and uh, a photosynthesis was created. So now we're able to take, the system is able to take photons and carbon dioxide and, and, uh, and uh, convert those into another, I would call them a currency, uh, which would be uh, uh, glucose, right, and what's and, and oxygen, and then some other. Uh, once that started, other processes realized, oh, we have a lot of an abundance of glucose and uh, abundance of uh, 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 of water. Uh, then other processes evolved that took glucose or water as input and then generated other things. And so, <clears throat> when you look at the uh, environment, what you see is many different currencies. If you define currency, let's say, as a molecule that somehow holds energy that's trapped inside the molecule, but not everything can use the same. Currency. So you have different processes that take one currency's input, do a transformation, do something useful with that currency, and then create another currency. And then when there's an abundance of a current, certain currency, processes evolve to take that output and then convert it into something else. And what's really interesting is when you look at all these loops and they're all interconnected, um, what you come up with is a multiple complex networks that interact. So if you look at our body, we have a nervous system, we have an immune system, we have a, a microbiome. And so when your brain is trying to tell your spleen to do something, it sends a signal. But what happens is there's a part of that pathway where actually a T cell is required to do a transformation into acetylcholine. So somehow, for some reason, your cis body has decided that between your brain and your spleen, uh, the, the immune system gets involved to do a transformation. And what happens when you have all of these complex interacting networks is you have a very vibrant and energetic system, but you also have a self-regulatory system, and that regulation is what helps keep our body temperatures the same, gives us a resistance to pathological uh, invasions and things like that. So, so billions of years of evolution have created a very resilient, robust system, um, which is sort of under attack by some of our exponential growth that we have, but I think it's also under attack because of this somewhat fragile notion of having a single currency that we trade in and out of. So right now, we say things like, uh, how can he be smart if he's not rich? You know, we measure everything right now in sort of this financial value. And I think what's really exciting and interesting about currencies is when they don't necessarily transfer in and out of single exchanges. So, so one example, this is sort of a stupid example, but I used to play World of Warcraft a lot, right? And I would play eight hours a day, and, and we had a, a guild. And, um, and I, you know, one of the great things, now, World of Warcraft money, um, gold, you can buy on the internet, but you're not supposed to. And I had a pretty big guild with hundreds of members, <coughs> and we would kick out anybody who would buy gold. Because what would happen is if, you know, Neha and I are going to do a raid the next day, but she's, let's say she, let's say she had kids, she has to take care of her kids at night, so I might stay up all night um, you know, mining uh, uh, and collecting gold to help her buy her, you know, her, uh, her cape that she needs for the raid. Well, if she knows I've been up all night preparing and helping her get ready for the raid that we're going to do together, there's a lot of value in my transfer of that item to her in the morning. But if she knows I've been online and bought the gold for 20 bucks from some uh, gold farmer, it's not nearly as interesting. And what's really interesting about World of Warcraft items and gold, and at one point, the items that I had in the game, I remember thinking this, that they're more important and valuable to me than anything I own in the physical world, right? And that's because you couldn't do that transformation of the value out. And, and again, you could go and buy gold and buy items, but first of all, if Blizzard caught you, they would ban your character, and that's tens of thousands of hours of work that disappear. And all of your friends were th would think you're an asshole. And so, so the, the value of World of Warcraft gold as a currency was its inability to be fungible or transferable, let's say, to, to cash. 
And so I think one of the design problems that we have when we talk about sort of um, cryptocurrencies is everybody thinking about fintech, you know, and, and that it's a driver for fintech and that if it's about liquidity, I think it's, it's because we're looking at the world as um, sort of economists rather than thinking about the world as, uh, as a complex system. Um, another piece <coughs> that I think we need to think about is uh, machines or AI. And one really interesting way to think about it is, so Norbert Wiener um, was a mathematician at MIT, and uh, he's, you know, he's, he's gone now, but he, he said a really interesting thing that um, he thought that uh, uh, corporations were uh, machines of flesh and blood. And <clears throat> if you think of rules or um, in, in, in companies or governments as, <coughs> as a kind of automation, um, bureaucracies are really machines, and corporations are machines. And in many ways, when you think about corporations, they um, behave like an AI, right? And so, so when I think about the future of machine learning or AI, I think we're already kind of there because in a way, we're doing this sort of manually. And when you think about sort of how uh, uh, a legal entity like uh, uh, a corporation, I mean, we're already treating it as a person. Um, it can control things. It can live beyond the life expectancy of a human being. Um, and as we think about how uh, machines are going to get integrated in them, so at the Media Lab we use the term extended intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. I don't think it's some AI that we're going to be sort of interacting with. I think we're going to take things like corporations or bureaucracies or systems and we'll be starting to see machines being used in amplifying the automation. But the dynamics, the system dynamics of these entities are going to be a lot like um, uh, what we think about in terms of corporations. So again, if you think about if you can, you, in some cases, we blame corporations for this kind of profit, like so we're in Silicon Valley, where you know the, the 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 motive and the goal and the operations of corporations guide a lot of things that uh, that determine um, where resources are allocated or what what people are incentivized to do. Um, and I think machines are not going to make the system more wise. They're not actually more intelligent. They're just going to be computationally more powerful. And so if you think about, again, an ecosystem, it's kind of like we're tweaking it by adding uh, uh, you know, different types of uh, processes that are, are, are going to do different things um, to a complex system that is also not really well regulated right now. And it's going to become harder to regulate because each of the processes will become computationally uh, more powerful. And uh, Rodney Brooks the, uh, the other day sent me an email saying, you know, the problem is that there, a lot of the current machine learning people are, he calls, computationalists. Um, rather than thinking about it as um, an interaction of networks. And I think an interaction of networks, I think, is a good way to think about how, how automation will work. But to tie it back to Bitcoin, I think that what, when you think about the, uh, uh, the, the substrate on top of which a lot of this stuff happens is the market, right? Is, is, is you, you, you get capital from the market, you, you sell uh, products, you pay your workers. So a lot of the exchange of um, of currencies between these processes are done in, in, in some sort of financial currency. And so what I think just like uh, machine learning and AI will uh, augment and extend, I'm using the word intelligence but not that intelligent, um, I think that a lot of the tools that we're building today will also create an ability for uh, these systems to transact in, in, in new ways. But again, I, I, I do urge us to think about this kind of like thinking about climate, right? So one of the reasons that we have a climate problem is that we've been trying to create exponential growth um, by increasing earnings and sort of taking more for ourselves by extracting value from the environment and exploiting the environment. And so a lot of the tools of modern post-industrial uh, society is, is really about, um, you know, so, so like if you look at post-war Europe, post-war Japan, it was all about trying to rebuild these countries. You just, you needed more stuff. You needed factories, you needed roads, you needed basic sort of lower uh, Maslow's hierarchy layers. But once you get beyond that, most of the problems that we have today, obesity, uh, uh, climate, they are occurring because we are trying to make more stuff. And I think one of the things that we should be thinking about is how do we create a vibrant ecosystem that's flourishing but isn't all about getting more stuff. And I think that currency and, and, and the appropriate application of the ability for processes to transfer value to each other, if you think about it as a system rather than just an exponential curve and the worship of singularity and progress, um, I think you might actually end up um, making a, a, a more flourishing system. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit because I think, and I think many people have talked about this, but um, you know, I'm sort of... Uh, uh, <clears throat> 
an internet guy, so I look at the uh, uh, world from the lens of the internet. And I think the success of the internet, there's a couple of key ideas that I think we can use as parallels. Um, so one thing, getting back to ecosystems, is the internet is very vibrant because it's an ecosystem of, of many, many products and ideas that connect to each other through different protocols. And I remember when I invested in Twitter, a lot of people said, oh, well, that's not even a product, that's just a feature. How can that actually become a company? And it was only as we started to develop, you could see that even if it's just a feature, if it's a well-designed, agile feature that's valuable, um, it's actually a thing. And so in the old days, you had these monoliths, and then you had products, companies, and, and, uh, and then you started to see little features, and, and the relationship between the features allows a lot of agility, it allows, again, some, the system to be dynamic and responsive, um, and it allows kind of innovation uh, at the edges rather than trying to create these models. So I think the ecosystem model of innovation is really important. And then if you think about how that exists, um, one thing that's really important, I think, are the layers. So, so if you think about um, the internet compared to previous systems is that, you know, the previous system, you had telcos that just did the whole thing from the fiber to the protocol to the network and on up. And I think the success of the internet were these layers. So you had uh, Ethernet that was sort of designed by Bob Metcalf and the guys at Xerox PARC. And then you had TCP IP, which was DARPA funded and university organized. Then you had HTTP, which was Tim Berners-Lee at, at, at uh, CERN. And then you had arguably not as important as the others maybe, but Netscape created SSL that allowed encrypted communication over, over the web. <clears throat> and each of these spawned a company or, or a layer of companies. So, um, you know, Bob Metcalf walked across the street and created 3Com which for the switches. Um, and then once TCP IP was locked in, Stanford sort of gave birth to Cisco, which became the largest company in the world, right? And were, there was just, they were just doing things that did TCP IP. And not just Amazon, but a whole bunch of for-profit companies got created when the web was standardized. Um, and again, we, we were able to do certain category of payments once we had SSL. Um, but if you look at this, what's important is you, um, when Ethernet was sort of being fought over, and many of you may still be old enough to remember, but we had like Token Ring, we had Apple Talk, we had Novell Networks, there were so many network protocols. But the other interesting thing is Token Ring was like Ethernet and TCP IP, it was like multiple layers. So kind of like how Ethereum is trying to do uh, more layers than Bitcoin. The, where the layers were cut isn't technologically deterministic. It actually is about the communities, right? So you have Ethernet, which wasn't the best protocol, but it had sort of the least amount of uh, uh, encumbrance. It had the right people getting excited about it. It was sort of in the right place at the right time, so Ethernet became a standard. Um, similarly, I think with TCP IP, it was just sort of groups of people getting together, trying to solve problems, and you have people like David Clark who kind of said, oh, well, maybe we can connect these together and let's, let's test it out. Um, you know, obviously with, I mean, before HTTP, we had, you know, SGML, we had all different kinds of markup languages and, and, and linking protocols, and you had Waze, and you had um, Gopher, but it was the simplicity of the format, the openness from an IP perspective, and just kind of the influence that that group had and how they were able to recruit others. So I would say that while they are elegant uh, protocols for each of these layers, to me it's more of a community thing, right? It was the, the community of people who are able to sort of get together and figure these things out and get them to work and then convince everybody else that, you know what, we'll, we'll all use the same TCP IP. We're not, it, the TCP IP only works because there's only one of them, right? If you had four versions of TCP IP, the internet wouldn't work. Um, and, and the other thing is these intergovernment, non-governmental um, agencies like the Internet Engineering Task Force, ICANN, I was on the board for three years. It's a mess, but you would much rather have ICANN running it than the ITU. I mean, ICANN, deep down in the bowels of ICANN, you have these really smart technical people who are dealing with the names and numbers. And I remember one time the ITU said, oh, we should run this. And you know what we'll do? We'll just assign numbers like we do uh, postal codes, and we'll just give them to each country in serial. And everybody's like, and even the, the, the people who weren't super technical, were, they were like, oh, this is way too dumb. I mean, there's no way we can let these guys run it. And, and so by having the core community of technical people who could figure out how to keep track of the routing tables and things like that, that gave ICANN the legitimacy to be in charge of the names and numbers, and it, it's, it still is at, at, I mean, and I think I, we could have designed ICANN better, but I think another important thing, just I'll, as I, I'll mention, is that it, ICANN was physical meetings, right? So we had all of these people, governments, IP, um, the registrars, the registries, the people at large, and we'd have a big room and you have an open mic. 
And these meetings would go on for hours and hours and hours, but anybody could come up and say whatever they wanted. And we would argue and argue and argue, and by the end, we would come to something like consensus. <clears throat> and there's a whole bunch of people who disagreed, but we'd given them the mic for hours to say what they want. And then you'd look around the room and everybody would be kind of like, okay, we're tired, let's go with it. And if you were in the room and you've already had a chance to complain, you were much less likely to complain online, right? And so there are some people who were horrible online, and they're bad in person, but after you got the talking done, they wouldn't complain anymore online. And so I think what's also really important, and I think I find this, I notice this in our community uh, a little bit, is that online is just not the best place to get to consensus. I mean, you get to consensus by just sitting in the room until everybody's so tired, and then you look around and say, all right, no more objection, and then you're done, right? So, so the, 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 the messy process that is I can is actually a really important process to move the ball forward. And I think that that's something that we should learn from. And I think this meeting is important to get people in the room, but there are a lot of people who aren't in this room. And I think, I think there's, um, there's something to be said. And I think each of these layers, um, uh, like IETF, have their own process of doing consensus in, in a face-to-face -face method, but I think that's, that's, that's been key. Um, and, you know, and, and the reason these are important, so I'll say you know, Minitel is probably the most successful telco-based video tech system, and it was, you know, everything from the, the, the wires to the hardware to the software to the content was managed by uh, um, France Telecom, but, you know, it died because it was unable to innovate, it was very expensive to deploy, but it was important to have done, right? So this is, to me, something like R3, right? So you've got, like, an incumbent that's trying to build uh, and become the new version of this sort of... Uh, fintech stuff, but as an incumbent that's trying to do the whole stack, they're not going to fundamentally cannibalize their own networks or change the architecture too fundamentally. Um, to me, AOL, it's survived, right? But if you remember anybody who was back there, in the early days of AOL, it was a dial-up modems, it was a portal, it had the whole stack. But they were smart enough to say, okay, now that uh, TCPIP is, is fixed and we have ISPs, we're not going to do access anymore. And then once the web came out, they said, you know what, our portal doesn't make sense anymore. We're just going to do email and content. And now AOL still exists. Now, having said that, it exists in a much smaller form. Um, there are probably periods in AOL's history where if you had invested, you don't, wouldn't have made money. Um, but it still survives. So to me, Coinbase and these guys are kind of in this category where they're, they have to do the whole stack right now because the layers aren't, the protocols aren't fixed, but that they'll probably survive in some way because, and, and I think um, my view is probably um, Hyperledger is similar. I think after Brian joined, he sort of unbundled the layers. So even if all the different things die, this object might survive because it's sort of unlinked and unbundled from everything else. So the, the companies that are willing to throw away and cannibalize layers, I think will survive in some form. Um, but it's hard because when you're building something before you've decided the layers, you're sort of by definition having to make decisions or make choices that we don't know where the outcomes are going to be. But going back to my, my, my um, earlier slide, you see like the, the, the Cisco's of the world are the ones who are going to make the most money because, but they happen once we've determined the protocols and the layers. And I don't think we're there yet. I think we're investing as if it's 1990 or 99, but I think the protocol is like 90 or 89. So, so I think we're a little bit ahead of our skis from a venture perspective. So I think Bitcoin will probably be the next layer. So I think, you know, but it's not, but it's kind of still like we have, you know, Ethereum is like Novell Networks and we just have all these other um, competing networks going on right now. Um, another interesting way to look at this is that, <coughs> um, you know, you have these sandwiches, so so these nonprofit collaborative layers are really good at um, and and to to sort of bring people together. And it's important to remember they're also not government, right? So they're nonprofit, non-governmental agencies. And then the competitive layers. So I would say the competitive layers are really good for scaling and execution. So like nonprofit communities are really not good at at execution. What they're good at is trying to come up with a mindset. What what are we trying to do here? Um, what's the purpose of this layer? Uh, can we come to consensus on a protocol? And once you've done that, then the execution people come in where they don't have to worry about the mindset or they just execute and they get shit done. And I think it's important to have layers of getting shit done sandwiched between layers of protocols. And, and so, you know, whether it's Creative Commons and, and, and Flickr, um, you, want, you, need, you need the sandwich. And I think that was the success of the internet was the unbundling um, and the ability to compete aggressively on one layer 
without sort of screwing up your values because you're sandwiched between uh, nonprofit layers where, where you have some control of the mindset. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I think this is Neri's, not Neri's, uh, Neha's slide. But I think, you know, hopefully we'll figure out the payments layer, but there'll probably be other layers. Exactly what's going to be in the other layers, who's going to be the, the stewards of those layers, and um, how they're going to be sliced, I think, is still um, open to uh, both discussion and innovation. Um, Lessig wrote a book in 99 called Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, which I think is an important way to think about how things will evolve. So he's a lawyer, so he put law on top, but architecture is a technology. So for example, if you want people to not speed down a road, you can either pass a, a law for the speed limit, or you can put s speed bumps in, and they may have the same effect, um, one, both of them causing people to drive more slowly. And so depending on what you're looking at and who the person is and what your values are, um, you may use a law in some cases, or you may use technology with a similar outcome. Norms are kind of the behavior and the so sort of social norms of society, and the market is, uh, is businesses and, and, and the market. So for example, you know, we do, with self-driving cars, we did a survey um, in Iyad Rawan's lab, and it basically said humans, most people surveyed, and we surveyed millions of people, um, believe that you should sacrifice a passenger to save more lives. So if you had to swerve and sacrifice a passenger, you should do that if you're gonna save, let's say, 10 people. But they said, I would never buy that car, um, but everybody else should. And in fact, government shouldn't regulate it. So suddenly you have this interesting thing where the norms, where the society is saying we should have s passenger sacrificing cars for uh, increasing uh, security, but that the market isn't the solution and that the law isn't the solution. So then what is the solution, right? So, so the, as we start to think about who should be the custodians of different processes, um, and let's, you know, can, I think my next slide is ICOs. As we think about something like ICOs, you've got the SEC, you've got the market, you've got technology, you've got, who, who should be in charge of figuring out where ICOs go? Um, I think we've got a lot of ICO fans in the room, so I'm gonna talk about ICOs. Um, you know, I think Alex Marcos tweeted this. I'm gonna get the exact words wrong, but um, I retweeted it, and I think he said something like, the difference between ICOs and, 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 and raising money for a, a, a startup is you're not, res like the entrepreneur can just walk away with the money with an ICO. I mean, the, the fundamental problem with ICOs is that the, the token holder doesn't have rights against the company. And to me, the, the, the real problem that I have with ICOs is I think the technology has a tremendous amount of potential, but going back to design, um, I mean, it, it's kind of, I, I'm, I get kind of emotional about this because it's like the whole point of doing all this stuff that we're doing because we think that the financial institutions were ripping us off because whoever was closest to the cookie jar was stealing cookies. Well, that's basically what we're doing with ICOs. We're sort of pretending that we're issuing tokens to help this network or do this or do that, but we've created a structure where we can just steal money and it's just, it's just bad. And, and I think if you separate out, for instance, um, uh, the three elements of money, which is one is um, transactions, the other is store of value, and the other is unit of account. So if you take miles, for instance, the reason we don't have crazy people getting ripped off with airline miles is they're pegged to uh, uh, something that doesn't float in value. So, so people don't speculate. I mean, they, they exchange miles, but they don't speculate on miles because the, 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 there's no volatility in the mile pricing. So one way you can deal with it is you could just fix it. Um, you could also make it like these currencies I talked about in the environment is non-transferable. So you could say, okay, you can buy the tokens, but then you can only redeem the tokens for the thing that you're trying to create the tokens for. That would also eliminate, but basically, let me go back. The problem is we're creating a system where people can pump and dump or they can speculate. And the minute you can speculate, you're gonna attract speculators, right? Who are basically people who are making money off of suckers. So you are also attracting the suckers. So, so anything where you're intentionally attracting suckers, well, why would you do this? Well, because you also want to be a scammer. I mean, like, like I, I think you kind of have to be very, should, like everyone who's issued an ICO needs to sit down and meditate and say, why am I doing this, right? If it's really for making society better, then you should try to figure out every possible way that you can't make money unfairly and that no one else can make money unfairly. So maybe that's making sure that the, the thing cannot be transferred back to money so that there's no such thing as an exchange or somehow peg it to the dollar so that there's no, there's no volatility. And once you create the perfect token, whether it's a token for um, carbon credits or it's a token for access to your network, 
But if you can design out a way for you to steal money or take cookies from the cookie jar illegally or unfairly, then you're pushing away the people who are going to make you look like an asshole later. And, 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 and we're technologists. We should be able to do that. But instead, what we're doing is we're always thinking about, oh, well, but you know, this is, whole point is to raise money as a startup. And, and you've, you've unintentionally, even, and, and a lot of people, I think, are very self-righteous. They say, well, but the thing I'm building is this open source software. This is, so it's OK if I steal money because I'm trying to do the right thing. But, but that's, that's, like, that's what everybody says, right? And that's how everybody starts down the slippery slope. And the whole point of cryptocurrencies and all these other things is to try to use technology to prevent people from, technically prevent people from doing bad things. But the minute you start thinking, uh, uh, like, I, I want to get into personal things, but like, I remember somebody saying, well, I hate how the, these, um, the right wing um, buy the media and use the media to tell other stories, so I'm going to go buy a newspaper so I can tell left wing stories. I mean, it's just this weird thing that somehow we think that we're above being scammers because we're, anyway, co coming back to ICO, so, um, and, and so, so I think there's two things as personally. So I never want to be involved in a company right now that's doing an ICO, even if it's technically impossible to do something bad, because we're right now in a period of history where it's just attracting all the wrong people. So even if you were to execute a perfect ICO with all of the constraints so you would never make any money um, unfairly, um, I think that it would still attract the wrong people, and I think, to me, it reminds me a lot of this. So this is the, the internet bubble, right? And I remember when I was here in Silicon Valley during the internet bubble, you couldn't make a good company even if you tried, because what would happen is all of your staff would be talking to uh, idiot investors who were trying to invest money in pets.com, and, and it was so hard to make a real company because the, the problem was you could make money doing nothing, and so all of the people who worked for you would say, wait, why am I doing anything if I can make money doing nothing? And so it's really, really hard to get anyone to do anything. And so what happened and what was really exciting was in like 2002, 2003, I was hanging out here and there was no more money. And the only people who were here still were people who loved the technology or who were had not, didn't know how to do anything else. And that's when blogging emerged. You know, I invested in Six Apart, which was Ben and Mina, and they had just lost their jobs. Um, most of the best bloggers were actually people who had just lost their jobs in .com, and they had a lot of free time. And that actually created a lot of the important content on the internet. So to me, the post bubble was really the most exciting period of the internet. So I feel like right now we're in this bubble era and I feel really bad for you guys, especially the honest ones, because you're sitting around watching all these people making money doing nothing. You're like, why am I sitting here doing something and not making any money? Um, and some of you will be right. I mean, there were people who made money on the up of the, um, of the dot com and walked away just at the right time. But the majority of the people wasted uh, nearly a decade of their life building something and then having it destroyed by a bunch of speculators who came in and just distorted the value of the company. And there's a famous saying that there's nothing worse for a CEO than overpriced stock. Because if your stock value goes above the real value of your stock, what happens is then the only thing that can happen next is they find out that the company isn't worth as much and then you're fired. Right? So most really strong, robust companies always fight to try to keep their stock price down so that they always outperform the expectations of the market. The minute the market expectation goes beyond your ability to deliver, then all you, you're just gonna lie, cheat, and steal to try to hit those numbers, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And so, so again, anything that's overpriced in the long run is a bad idea. In the short run, somebody can steal some money, but they just gotta get out before it crashes. And so if you're in this field for the long run, right now is a really bad time, because I think everything is a bit overpriced. And it's only good for the people who aren't long-term players, people who can walk away because they don't really give a shit about what we're working on. And those, those people, I think, are sort of polluting our system. So it's a somewhat negative. Having said that, I will say that a lot of us that worked on uh, the network even during the bubble, the key thing is, I think, that when it's crashing is when you really see, um, build the relationships um, that will last. And so that when you're building again, these are the people, like the people I still hang out with are the people that were part of my network when we were sort of, when everything was crashing and the people who stuck around to make sure that things kept running. So getting back to um, complex adaptive systems, there's certain ways that you intervene in complex systems. Um, 
one really important thing is, uh, so everybody knows Monopoly, right? Um, so there was a game before Monopoly called The Landlord's Game, which is the game that was a precursor. It was in 1904. And it was a game that tried to teach children that uh, ownership and rents would drive everyone bankrupt and make the world really unhappy. So it was to teach kids about how bad capitalism was. Um, and it wasn't that popular, but then um, Parker Brothers changed the goal of the game, but didn't change the rules. They made the goal, you become the capitalist and drive your friends bankrupt, and then you be win, right? And so what happens, what's interesting is it's not a, the rules weren't in, as important as the goals. The goals dictated how the game was played. Um, often people say it's about winning arguments about information. Well, the heart attack, you know, quad, the quadruple bypass burger is 8,000 calories. If you're 350 pounds, you eat for free. And it's about a 30 minute wait to get in, right? So people always argue with me, well, if we just labeled food better, if you win the argument, no, 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 these people know what's going on. It's not an information problem, right? So it's a cultural problem. And so to me, uh, this is Andrew Fletcher from the 1700s, uh, he was a Scottish lawmaker. He said, let me make the songs of a nation. I care not who makes its laws. Because the songs change culture. They outlast laws. They're the way that you transmit cultural change. And Donella Meadows has this great thing. This is busy and hard to read. But basically, she, she's a, a systems dynamics person from MIT. Um, and she wrote this, I think, in the 70s, probably. Um, but, but the idea is that you know, these constants, these rules, these other things you can, you can modify, but when you go down to the, the most important things that you can change in a system that has the most effect, one is the goals, like the goal of, for monopoly changed, but the mindset is really important. So why are we here? Are we here to try to make more money and get more stuff? Or are we here to try to make uh, a, a network that's beautiful and robust and resilient and have a good time? But the other meta point is the power to transcend paradigms. This is the power to think for yourself and question authority, right? And I think one of the problems that we have is we are now a lot of us are still kind of thinking as, like economists, not questioning the fundamental value. Does making more money make us happier? Does making more stuff make society better? And no, right? I mean, we, we, I think that the, the, the digital currency should feel more like a left-wing conspiracy than a, than a commercial conspiracy, but we're being usurped by the greedy, uh, enticing, somewhat yummy thing idea about making more money. But the problem that we're trying to fix is the fact that we have this really stupid single currency that causes us to be wasteful, to be greedy, to be mean to each other, to not be able to come to consensus. And I think what we want to do is try to figure out a technical way to break that mold. And I think it starts by um, this uh, power to transcend paradigm. So I would, I would finish by saying I think it's really important for conferences like this where people can feel free to question each other, question authority, think for themselves and argue. But in order to have that, you have to have a basic trust that we're all kind of on the same side. And that was what was important about these technical layers like the IETF and ICANN, is the ability for people to fight with each other about these basic ideas like why are we here asking big questions. Um, and I think right now what we're doing is we've got a bunch of splintered groups fighting over things, details like rules and technologies and things like that rather than asking sort of the basic questions of what are we trying to build. Because the ICO problem goes away if we all agree that the point of ICOs isn't to try to steal money from stupid people, but it's in fact to try to create some kind of method for uh, doing the system in a more fair way, right? And I think that that, that I, I feel like we're not actually having the conversation and we're, we're, we're arguing about the details. So hopefully you guys uh, uh, will, will fix that with Scaling Bitcoin. Thank you. Okay, that was incredible. Uh, although we're a little past the, a lot of time, I want to give a chance for us to ask a few questions. Um, so we've got mics there and there. Anybody want to have any questions for Joey? Hi. Uh, great talk. Thanks for that. Um, we spoke a lot about uh, protocols and infrastructure with reference to the internet. I was wondering uh, about your thoughts as to how far we've come and how far we have to go in terms of the infrastructure and the protocol layer of, of Bitcoin mm -hmm. and other... Uh, cryptocurrencies. Yeah, so I, I, I do feel like it is pre-TCPIP and that we haven't gotten something that is uh, like that you, you, we haven't won the battle yet. Because I, I remember when I was running a network, I still had X25. And, and so I think we're there. I think the, the thing that's interesting too is that I do think that Bitcoin Core has 
substantially more brain firepower and people firepower than any of the other networks. And, and that was, I think, the turning point for the internet. I remember when we were setting up our first ISP um, in Japan, there was like one guy who knew how to do BGP in all of Japan, and there were like 20 ISPs, and he would go around and fix everything. And so I think we're still at that period where there are a few people kind of who understand the full stack. We've got core developers. But I don't think yet that we've gotten to the point where everyone else is convinced that that's true or that these people are now all focused and working on the same problem. Um, so I think, but I think we're close, but I am worried that, as I said, when we were fiddling around with the internet, there wasn't that much money in it. And we had a couple decades to sort of mess around and get the thing right before people were upset and, uh, when it wasn't working. And I think the problem right now is we've got all of these people who are so invested in it that um, it's putting this weird financial pressure um, that's making it hard because, I mean, because to be honest, people weren't paying attention to us that much. So I think that Bitcoin has too much attention and it's harder to do that. So my concern is the difference uh, is that it's much harder to come to consensus around the code. And we also don't have a John Postel or, I mean, or somebody who can just sort of wave the wand and just um, decide. Um, and, and so those are the two things that are different. So I don't know that there's a direct parallel. I think it's harder. Um, but I think, I, th I still think that core is where, where it's going to happen. Though. So I'd like to ask a question for a CEO whose employees are all fully vested and none of them are under lockup. And the question is, uh, to the CEO, um, how do you get correct pricing information and release information about the value of your product without speculators? So, so you're saying there's a company where everyone's fully vested and you're creating a product, and I'm sorry, I'm not sure so I understand exactly the, the question. The important point is that the, the employees, if they believe that anything's overpriced, they can sell immediately. Yeah, um, so it's hard, right? I mean, I, th I think that, that the, 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 that, I, again, getting back to, 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 to the principles is I think you have to transcend, you, you have to make it feel, there's two, two things that I would do. First, you have to make it feel like the mission is more important than the money. And the people, and it's going to be hard, and you'll lose a lot of people because a lot of people just say, you know what, I've got a kid, I've got, you know, I, you know, I've got my parents' expectations, I've got to take the money. But a lot of companies, you can still end up with a core group of people who are more, two things, more concerned about the mission and the group than about the money. But also, you know, what goes up must come down, and they may get a little bit of money in the short run, and they may leave, but... I, I definitely think the long game is much more interesting, and I'm old, I'm 51 years old, so I've, I've been through lots of cycles, and all of my best experiences and best friends have been not during these moments where I've like sold stock and gone up, it's been through the experience of like working together, and all of your memories are created by doing good work. So for people who have never done this before, who it's hard to retain, but I think it's about creating a corporate culture, and, and again, it's really hard, because if you look at the internet bubble, very few companies survived it because all the people kind of sold out when the price went up. But the ones that did survive are the ones, I think, or, or that were built at the bottom were the ones that are big now. So uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, I submit that the, the only way to understand the, uh, the value of the product uh, is through uh, the market. Well, it depends what market you're talking about, right? Because if you're, it's the market of the shares, what you're basically selling to are people who are it's the old the greater fools theory, right? As long as there's a bunch of suckers who will buy the shares at, um, so let me say two things. So certain, certainly I agree that um, for many companies, there is no fundamental basic underlying value that the market determines the value. But if your market is primarily people who are buying it either through the understanding of the utility or for long uh, holding, I think you will get a fairly fair price. But if you have a short market, um, where people are trying to, they're buying to sell, then I, I think that the price, um, you know, is, is, I wouldn't say is a, is a rational price. It's a, it's, it's a short price, which is, which is dangerous. Yeah. I agree that this is dangerous. Thank yeah. you. Hi, quick question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I've been talking about the same stuff about the ICOs, uh, but everyone's afraid to name names in this space. Um, can you uh, name an <laughs> ICO that you think is doing things right and an ICO that everyone has heard of that you feel is doing things wrong? Well, I, let's see, 
I haven't looked into enough to know anyone that I would name as doing it right. Okay. Um, so, um, so that's sort of by definition names the ones that I think are doing it wrong. Um, um, because I think there's, because the, the, the problem is that you, you can't really do it right. So here's my view, is if, even if you're not hurting somebody directly, if you're enabling somebody else to cause harm, then you're responsible. And I feel like right now the ICOs don't have enough controls that prevent somebody downstream from causing harm. And as long as you've got a bunch of you know, people who are n not well educated, who are buying these ICOs at an overpriced thing, down the line they're going to lose their money and in, the, in my view it causes harm. So just sort of by definition, and now I haven't yet seen an ICO where it's impossible for anybody to speculate on it. And that would be the only version that I could see right now where you wouldn't be, you, you somehow prevent down, downstream harm. So, so to me, I think that, that that's, and I'm being a little bit extreme here because I, you know, everything causes, can cause some harm in some way. But right now, again, because the market is so uh, full of people who are easily harmed, I think that uh, I w I, that's why I would never do an ICO right now. Oh, thank you. Good answer. Thank you. I, uh, I took the chance to make you a question just to thank you for every important word you've said. And uh, also, I hope you understand me because mm -hmm. my English is so and so. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned uh, Alex Marcus, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, I'd like to remember his tweet uh, because it, it has been very important for me because mm -hmm. for months, uh, I didn't understand what I didn't really like about uh, ICOs, mm -hmm. and he just tweeted that uh, uh, the ICO characteristic is that uh, if you fail with your mm -hmm. product and with your business plan and with your design, you're still able to get away with a lot of money. Yeah, I and this creates a difference in incentives. Yeah. I think I just found the tweet. It says, here's one big difference between traditional startup funding and ICOs. Founders of failed startups shouldn't walk away financially enriched. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great quote, Thank and I, I totally agree. Last question over there. Yeah. Hi, uh, I have a question. It seems like you don't get involved into ICOs because of a timing issue. But if you, in the future, would go, is there, is there like a checklist you would look for an ICO? So, so I, I think what you want to do is, I think, again, I might not use the word ICO for everything. I think it's about a, like a category of tokenization. And I think that you want to do, what you want to do is you want to figure out exactly what you're trying to do, right? So for instance, if you're trying to tokenize trees to, do, to help uh, carbon cap and trade, and, or if you're de deploying a whole bunch of solar panels uh, to try and try to fund those, you could, you could create securities for those and issue them as a token. But I think what you want to do is you just want to just, I mean, you want to add the minimum, it's kind of like when you do proper uh, 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 test-driven code, right? You want it to pass the test, but no more. And I think the problem right now that we have with ICOs is you're adding, oh, and let's make a feature so we can actually make some money on the side. You know, so, so I think what you want to do is you want to say, okay, what are we trying to do? We're trying to create a system to improve the ability for somebody to directly fund solar panels in India. Okay, well then what do we need to uh, uh, lock in? What does the exchange want to look like? And how do you try to limit the ability for scammers to come in but increase the ability for long-term investors to come in, and how would you try to implement as much of those regulatory things that would normally go through all these intermediaries that would steal your money in code, right? And, and, and then how would you try to secure that? So for me, it's really, again, going back to first principles, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to get a bunch of Indian entre photovoltaics entrepreneurs money from the American market. And, and so, so, and again, that's, that's one particular one. Another one could be something like a, 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 a currency for, uh, um, uh, you know, a, 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 let's say an open source project that's working on paying publishers or something like that. Well, what you want to do is you want to figure out how do we try to, so, so it's sort of the opposite, because if you have volatility, that's great for people who want to go in and out of the market and try to make money. But it's not great for people who are trying to use it to 
know how many subscriptions of the New York Times they're going to have next year with the money they've put in. So if you're trying to reduce volatility, what you want to do is reduce, reduce a certain kind of liquidity. And so maybe that's a way by saying that you can go into the currency, but you can't go out. And so I think what you're trying to do is, again, if you, you're designing it to try to reduce volatility, you will reduce the ability for a certain category of people to make money. So even like the 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 the, the SAF, the safe you know the, the 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 safe token thing. So if you're trying to raise a bunch of money from venture capitalists, well, they're not going to buy your tokens if they're not going to make money, and they're not going to make money unless there's volatility. And so I think the point is, if the point of the ICO is to make money, um, again, make money is sort of a weird thing. Make money without doing anything, let's say, um, then it's always going to increase harm. If you try to tr create a token where you only make money in the end, this gets back to the Alice Morcos quote, if you only make money in the end if you're successful, so maybe there's a, or, or you only make money in the end if the underlying value that you've created is actually worth anything, then you can design the thing that I think is pretty clean and fair. Um, but the problem I think also is that this whole notion of ICO, it sounds like IPO, and IPO, again, is kind of a sucker's game in the real world where the investment make, bank makes a bunch of money by buying your stock cheap and, sell, and, and, and selling it through the boiler room to poor people who don't know any better. And it, again, is this idea of like, you have the same company, but suddenly when it goes public, everybody has more money than they had before. Well, again, this is like making money without doing anything other than going listing. And so, so the notion of just because you change your structure, suddenly you have more money. Now, it's important to do that sort of thing to make systems more efficient. So it's not like every structural change is bad, but if you create a whole, whole ecosystem out of just making money through doing a transformation, then I think you're, you're, you're attracting th that wrong person. So it's sort of a long-winded way of saying some of the stuff I've already said. But, but, I th but, but again, I think it's, we have a whole toolbox, and that's why we have cryptographers in the room. It's not like a packaged product that you have to use it in the same way. Um, I think we really need to figure out what are we trying to do and then cut out all of the other things that don't support that first principle. All right, thank you, thank Joey. You. Thank you. Okay, well, we just went uh, really wide there. Great perspective, thank you, Joey. Um, now we're gonna, we're gonna start jumping in a little deeper, so uh, is this okay? So um, our our next talk is going to be getting into kind of layer two, and so thinking about again leaving what needs to be done at the base layer there. What are we able to do on the second layer? Um, and uh, for this talk, we've got actually okay. Sorry, we've got Aviv Zohar uh, speaking about how to charge lightning. So it's going to be a framework uh, for economic analysis of the lightning network and its effect on transaction fees on the blockchain. So reasoning about um, demand for transactions, different topologies, the Lightning Network, and how that affects fees both uh, on the second layer and on the first layer. All right, thank you. Oh, are we here? Okay. So I'm glad uh, to have heard uh, Joy talk about ICOs, and I'm also glad it took us a whole day to get there uh, and not mention it. Uh, I think it speaks for this conference. So I'm, I'm going to talk about a little bit of economic modeling for the Lightning Network. I want to start by, by cautioning you to, to say that an economic model is in some sense a form of opinion. There are going to be assumptions that I'm going to make. Uh, you might not agree with them. I hope uh, the talk stimulates you to come and talk to me afterwards uh, about these assumptions. Um, so our goal here uh, is to understand right, uh, how we're going to manage uh, transaction channels, um, specifically uh, from the economic perspective, how much money are we going to put into them, how much, how are we going to reset them, uh, what are we going to do with them. And in some sense, I want to know what the effect of these channels on the economics of Bitcoin would be, right? So what are we to expect from fees, uh, what's the volume that would be transacted on-chain and off-chain, um, etc. Right? So, so maybe the, the crucial point here is that we lack data 
to, to talk about these things. We don't know how, how people are gonna use Lightning. This is all speculative, right? So uh, there are a lot of modeling assumptions that go in here. And uh, of course, time will tell and we'll have more data, but this is an early attempt. So I'm gonna start with, uh, with maybe a simple uh, uh, beginning, right? Talking about a single channel between Alice and Bob. Uh, we've heard about channels uh, yesterday, so I'm not gonna go into the details. Uh, and I will say that I am assuming here that all channel closures are cooperative. This is not about the security of channels. Alice is not gonna try to cheat Bob out of his money. Everything's gonna run as if everybody's you know, doing their best effort. Uh, so they're going to open up a channel, maybe pour some money into it, uh, some uh, 10 bitcoins maybe. And every time Alice moves a money, her, one, one of her bitcoins to Bob, or Bob moves one of his bitcoins to Alice, the liquidity within the channel shifts. So you could think of it as if we're on a state space between zero and 10, and if we were just transacting single units of, of bitcoins, we're just uh, moving around there. And I'm going to assume that, uh, you know, just for the sake of, of modeling, that this is a, a random walk, that Alice doesn't know to, she can't predict whether she'll be paying Bob next or Bob will be paying her. It's all probabilistic. It could be a biased or un, an unbiased random walk. So some basic facts about uh, transaction channels uh, are that uh, you, you can, right, you can, you can start to do the math and especially for random walks, this is very well known uh, uh, stuff, right? So if Alice, starts to send money to Bob at, at, at a certain rate and Bob sends money back at a certain rate, we can look at uh, the expected lifetime of the channel. So there's a formula, this it doesn't tell us much, but we can look at, at a graph form, which is slightly better. And the, uh, right, what you see here is for bias transfers on a channel, basically, if we're slowly moving money, um, there's an optimal point at which we can fund the channel. The x-axis here is the b balance that Alice has. Let's say we, we'd like to begin uh, with most of the money, let's say, on Alice's side, uh, if we're doing, um, right, maybe above he or around here, if the transfers are biased, uh, so that uh, I think this is actually Bob's side, so uh, Bob is paying Alice and slowly will slip down this curve and money would flow. Um, right? We can even talk about channels that are balanced, where money goes back and forth with the same probability, and here the, the benefits of Lightning really start to show up, because if we put W amount of money into the channel, right, then the optimal uh, way to fund the channel is to actually start it up equally uh, with money from Alice and Bob, and the channel lifetime is going to scale up like the square of W. Right, so we're, we're, we're putting more money, like if, if we double the amount of money, we could quadruple the channel lifetime. Right, so this is a nice thing, this is the characteristic that makes lightning appealing, I suppose, that tra transfers get to cancel each other out and the channel lives longer. Right, so once you, once you start to look at, uh, um, at this, you have to start to ask yourself, okay, we're not gonna assume that Alice and Bob are just transacting a single coin between them. They're probably sending more money, right? What is a, uh, an okay model of the economy in some sense, right? So sometimes we make very small transfers, sometimes we make very large ones, right? I, I, I very often buy a cup of coffee or pay for, for a meal. Uh, sometimes I buy a car, right? So there are probabilities that I will be doing large transactions at any, at any given moment. And usually if you look at data for sizes of transactions, what you see is power laws. So basically the probability that you'll be doing uh, a very large payment scales maybe inversely and quadratically with the size of, of the payment, right? So this is uh, usually stuff that we see in data and uh, the exponent here might be different than two, not exactly two, it could be larger, it could be smaller, and so on. So, so this gives rise to distributions of, of money transfers that are, that are large. And then when you start to think about channels like this and you say, okay, when do I uh, restart a channel? When do I, how much money should I put into it for, to get the maximal effect from the channel? Uh, you start to find that it's beneficial very often to do, to reset the channel even though uh, you didn't reach 
the border of the channel, right? Sometimes you have this large hop that gets you maybe into this yellow area here, and you might wanna restart your channel at that point. Even though it still has money, you can still send a little bit from it, because the next transaction that can show up might again be a large one, and that large transaction is not gonna be useful. You're not gonna be able to do it with the channel. You're gonna to have to do it with a blockchain transfer, or you're gonna to have to open another channel anyway. So if you simulate this stuff, you actually do find that there is, uh, right, so what, what you're seeing here is the number of blockchain hits versus the radius at which I reset uh, a channel, and there's an optimal point, right? So there's a be better behavior than just waiting until the channel completely runs out. Sometimes I wanna reset it when it's not at the border, right? So we started looking at this sort of thing, basically the basic channel behavior. And then the next thing that's very natural to ask is, right, how much do channels cost? Right, there are, there are two main costs to a channel. I, I've just shown you before that if we increase the amount of funding in the channel, we basically extend its lifetime. So can I put in as much money as I want? Can I just pour a lot of money in there? So obviously not, there's, there's a limitation, and the limitation is that if I, I, can, I can always get more money, but I have to borrow it. I have to pay interest rates over, uh, to do that. So if I really want to fund a lot of channels and lock up funds in there, they're going to be moving between me, between Alice and Bob basically, back and forth, but never out of, of the channel. Um, they're losing potential interest that they could have gotten if they got, would have put the money elsewhere. And there's another cost, which is channel setup and uh, settlement, which has to touch the blockchain. You're gonna have fees, uh, and fees might be high, right? So you're trying to mitigate between these two costs, right? So these are the things we'll consider, um, right? So the next thing to ask is how are fees uh, collected, right? Uh, what would a Lightning transaction pay, and what would a Bitcoin transaction pay, right? So for, for regular uh, on-chain transactions, we, we already know there's a, there's a fixed fee for, for uh, blockchain use, right? That's how the mechanism is currently built. Um, on Lightning, it's, it's somewhat unknown, but uh, if you start to think about it, uh, you'll notice that if you do a large transaction in, in a Lightning channel, you really shorten the lifespan of the channel more than if you do a small transaction. Okay, so basically, you're, you make it much more likely that you'll incur a cost of having to reset the channel or establish it again uh, and pay a transaction fee. So it makes a lot of sense, at least in my, in my view, to, to charge lightning transactions, not a flat fee, but rather a proportional fee to the amount of money that's been moved. Right? And, and in some instances, a large transaction even uh, should cost super linearly in some sense, right? It, 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 it hurts the channel much more than it just its, uh, uh, its size. Okay, so, so this is, uh, I guess, also going into our model. And of course, what we wanna do is, is we want to give transactions a choice, right? Uh, I'm, I'm now assuming everybody's gonna have like this very nice wallet and all the UX, UI, uh, problems are gonna be fixed away, and while it's gonna make a decision for you, you're, you're asking to send money from here to there, and it'll either use the channel, if that's cheaper, or it'll use the blockchain, if that's cheaper, or you might see the fees and say, you know, this is just too expensive, I'm going to use something else, like Visa or Western Union or, you know, something, something other than Bitcoin, or maybe just not transact, right? So this, this is a possibility, and this is our, our model. So now I'm ready to show you the, the, the steps in the approach going from this micro management of channels to what happens to, to the economy. And what we're gonna do, maybe I'll, I'll uh, in general, is to, to think about a pattern of moving money. It's gonna be very simple to begin with. Um, then I'm going to talk about the, right, the channel management and topology and so on. And then the market equilibrium for, for these fees. And basically, um, right, the intuition that I want you to have in your head before I start to show you some of the results is, is that we're gonna have these large transfers that really prefer to go on the blockchain because on the blockchain they, they pay a flat fee and if they go through channels they pay proportionally to their size. We're gonna have a lot of small transactions that prefer the Lightning Network because they pay proportionally to their size which is really small 
and together they share the cost of establishing the channel and so on. So both of these sources of transactions are trying to touch the blockchain for different reasons. One is to establish lightning channels, and the other is to do direct transfers, and they're gonna be competing with each other. And it's not entirely clear which one drives up the price for the other. Do they both coexist? Is, are, the, are the large transactions uh, common enough and large enough that they squeeze out the lightning transactions, or is it vice versa? Right, so uh, this is exactly the question that, that interests me. Um, right, they both complete for records. So now I'm, I'm going to plug in some parameters. These, these are completely made up. You know, feel free to, to mock every one of them. Um, uh, I'm assuming every person from now on that I talk about has 10 transactions per day. That's it, that's what they do uh, in expectation. And we draw those, the, the amounts that they transfer from a parallel distribution like I, I defined before. Um, each, each one is willing to pay up to 1% of the amount that he's transacting as fees. You know, it, you could have set it to 2%, but I just picked one. Um, there's a 4% yearly interest rate. I know it's lower now, you know, it could be higher. I don't know, you know, it's made up. And uh, there are 288,000 on-chain uh, transactions that we can do every day. And so this is the, basically based on the block size before SegWit, because we don't have exact numbers on what SegWit's gonna do uh, in terms of uh, transactions when it gets fully adopted. I, I don't have a good estimate. If somebody does, I, I'd like to know. Um, so now, in terms of topologies, what am I going to assume about the world? How are people trying to transact before we, we say what, what, what their transactions do? I'm, I'm going to assume a very naive model. One of the, one of the naive models is just gonna be people are paired up together. Um, and they're just, you know, Alice and Bob are just sending money back and forth. That's it. So this is actually uh, designed to, to be nice to Lightning, right? We know exactly which Lightning channel to open. Everybody opens a Lightning channel to their, to their, to their uh, uh, pair, uh, right, to their uh, partner there. And they can send money back and forth. In, in reality, we'll have something much more complicated. But this is easy, right? This is supposed to be easy. Um, another thing that you might consider is some uniform payments. There's just, just a bunch of people in the world. Each one can be paying another with equal probability. We don't know who's gonna pay who. And in this world, it's hard to even think about what the topology of lightning nodes would be, right? So one very obvious suggestion that people have made is to use just one central hub. Yeah, I know this is centralized, but, it, but again, this is to make it easy for us to do the math and, and make it easy for Lightning to, to work efficiently. If I open a lot of channels, I might be wasting a lot of resources. This is very efficient, right? So this is the, the model that I'm gonna uh, talk about. And you, you have to notice that these things look different in the, in the sense of how much money they, they, they send and to whom, but really they're not too far apart because uh, the model with the pairs has one transaction channel for every two people, and the model with the hub has one transaction channel per person. So it's a factor of two on the cost of maintaining the transaction channels if we had exactly the same funding and exactly the same behavior in both. Okay, so this is, they're very related. I'm really gonna just talk about the pairs model and uh, just as a walkthrough example, but we've done more uh, in the paper that'll come out. So let me walk you through it. Um, so, right, here's the behavior of individuals. Did I skip a slide here? Yeah. So here's the funding of a channel, right? We're assuming we have some, some blockchain fee, and this could be in bitcoins or something, right? So this is just an example. And given this fee, I can decide on how much channel capacity to choose, right? I can uh, make the channel large with a lot of bitcoins or small, and I also fund it optimally in the sense that I put all the money equally between Alice and Bob if they're sending money uh, back and forth with equal probability. And so you can see that as I grow the channel capacity, uh, the, red, uh, the red curve is my total cost, and it's composed of two things. One, as the channel capacity grows, the, I have to touch the blockchain less often. So the green line here uh, goes down, I do less, resets of the channel, I don't have to touch the blockchain. On the other hand, 
this blue line goes up, the more money I put into the channel, the more interest rate that you know, I'm, I'll be paying, right? I'll be paying more interest. Um, and, and there's somewhere an optimal point of, you know, that I would want to be around uh, to fund the channel, right? And that minimizes my cost. Right, so now that we can do this for every, uh, for every fee, we can have a curve like this, we can look at what happens uh, basically to the channel capacity when we change the fees. Right, so when we change the fees, if I increase the fees slowly, the optimal ch channel capacity that I'm going to choose goes up like uh, pretty much like the square root of the fee times some constant. Okay, so this is exactly the benefits of Lightning. I can double the fees. I only have to have a channel that's square root of two times larger to, to manage and, and, and have uh, uh, good behavior. And from this, we can derive uh, demand for blockchain uh, records, right? If I put some of, some of my uh, funding in the channel, I can, I can now figure out which transactions find it uh, expensive to, to go through the channel, which transactions prefer to go through the blockchain from my uh, different payments that come out of, you know, in different sizes, I randomly select the size. And so I have this demand curve, and uh, if you look at it, this is this exactly the same curve on the log-log scale. It looks like a straight line, which basically means it's a power law, right? So I have um, uh, the uh, demand scaling down as one over the fee, and this is for a world that has uh, no lightning in it at all, right? So if I can't use lightning, because of the way I chose my distribution, I would get this demand curve. And in a world with lightning, you know, this demand curve looks very much the same, but it's not. If you look again on a log-log scale, instead of scaling like one over the fee, it scales like one over the square root of the fee. Okay, so that's a minor difference. What will it do to us? Uh, we'll see. Now, the, the next question is what happens when I scale up? I'm, so this demand function that I've just shown you is for a single Alice and Bob who are transacting, and I told them, okay, this is, this is your demand at every different fee. This is how many times you will want to touch the blockchain. But now I'm going to add a lot of these Alice's and Bob's into the world, uh, maybe 100 million of them, who all want to have their ch channel with their partner. Right, and this is what we're gonna be looking at. Right, so here are the fees. This is again without lightning. When we scale up the number of users, right, we go to you know, hundreds of millions, the fees go up. The equilibrium fee that sells all of the blockchain uh, uh, space goes up. So don't, don't get too hung up on the numbers here because remember we made up all the distributions, but I want you to look at this more qualitatively. Um, now, the, the next thing, of course, is what happens with Lightning, and this is where it gets a little bit interesting. So the demand curve had a, had a different shape to it, and you can uh, tell probably that uh, we're, we're, we're having very different fees. So one thing that's obvious to begin with is that we reach really, really high fees at the end. Lightning somehow manages to collect more money from people. Pe people are willing to pay it, and this is because some transactions join together in a Lightning channel, they, sh they split the cost of establishing the channel. They're willing to pay more to establish the channel. But really, if you look at the region here, between zero and you know, 20 million people, uh, we're, uh, it's a little hard to see, but we're making less money with Lightning because we added this technology that lets some stuff move off the chain. It's, the chain itself is less congested. There's less competition for the fees. And so, um, Fees are lower, up to 20 million people, higher above that. And if you want to think about the miners' revenue, well, this is exactly proportional to the miners' revenue because we just have a fixed amount of spots on the blockchain. We're selling them for those fees. So if the fees are lower, the revenue of miners is lower, and the security of the protocol that depends on all this mining power being poured in is lower. And if the fees are higher, the security is higher. Right, so we're seeing the effects of lightning uh, here. And another thing that is, I know is very controversial uh, is to talk about the block size, right? So here's the same curve before. This is the world with lightning. And now what happens when we scale the block up by a factor of two? Yeah, so I know this is highly volatile. 
This is a very hard topic to talk about. Um, but with an extra increase in block size, you would notice that the fees drop, right? So instead of having like 25 here, we have 10. This is, they drop by more than a factor of two. And you need to remember that we increased the block size, so there are now a factor of two more blockchain spots that we're selling. So the total revenue of miners has actually gone down by the block size increase, uh, as it might happen, okay? So, but, but we, are, we, are, we will be getting more throughput through because of it, but, but notice security in this case for this specific model with these assumptions has gone down. Right, so another interesting thing to look at is the, what goes through the, the Lightning Network and what goes through the blockchain. So the blue line shows us the transactions that actually go through the Lightning Network, and it's almost everything, and the red line is what goes through the blockchain. And that's next to nothing in terms of transaction counts. But this is in some way the wrong thing to look at because when you look at volume, right, most of the volume actually goes on the blockchain because these very few transactions that get in have very high value. This is, we, we're looking at a distribution of transfers that has a heavy tail. Some of the transactions are really, really huge. They are the ones that are competing successfully with channel establishment transactions. Right, so we see most of the value being transacted actually on-chain. And if you think about the contribution of Lightning, you know, without Lightning, these would still be here. They can pay for the chain. Lightning added this volume. Uh, it's great, right? There are a lot of transactions there in terms of count. We've seen that, but they're all really, really small. So in terms of value, maybe not so great. Right, so uh, here's the conclusion. I hope I've interested you enough to come and discuss this with me later. So, Lightning definitely helps, but now you have to decide for yourself. Do you think it's a lot or a little? I, I'm not really sure what to think. Um, I was frankly expecting Lightning to do a lot more in, in some sense. I wanted like a factor 100 on transaction throughputs and we got something in volume that was less than half what was, was already there and uh, in some sense, but in transaction numbers maybe a lot and we can do micropayments and suddenly it's, it's very different. Um, a two, two X block size increase helps, but, but not by very much. Uh, if you would go back and look at the graphs more carefully, it's not, not that amazing. But that's not really surprising because I, I, I showed you graphs that take the user count from, I don't know, 10 million to 100 million. So I took that by a factor of 10 and I only increased the block size by a factor of two. So obviously that's not gonna help a lot. Um, there is a lot that I didn't show you that's gonna be in our paper. Um, we're looking at heterogeneous populations. Things are very different if not everybody is exactly the same in transacting. Maybe some people are moving more money than others. Uh, they are basically pushing them out of, of the blockchain. Um, the results could be different. They are. Um, there are more complex patterns of flow. I, I just showed you this was all for the pairs model, which is very, very simplistic. Uh, there are other distributions of flows, right? You, you would probably imagine that flow is more circular in the economy. People don't just send money back and forth. I usually buy at different businesses and I get my money from a different source, my, my job. And so I, I circle money around in the economy. How would lightning channels look in that scenario? That's a very, really good question. And in general, I think, I think I'm, I'd like to voice my concerns, right? I, I don't know how fragile these models are and how fragile the economy of, of Lightning are, is to, to, to these assumptions, right? Would a change in interest rates suddenly do a huge shift in the results, right? Will we see an economic effect if something like this happens? You know, the fees are, are, are very important there, right? We, everything in the model was, um, you know, the average or expected behavior. What about fluctuations? Of course, we have them very often in the economy. Um, right, so I, I'll leave you with more questions, I hope, than what we started, because this is a good start for a debate. Thank you all. Hi, thank you for the talk, very interesting. Um, I'm wondering, how viable do you think it would be 
that when you have to move to the chain because your payment gets too big to be feasible on Lightning, that you don't purchase one service from the uh, counterparty, but two, and the second one being a reset of your Lightning channel. Sorry? Uh, so, so, what's so I send a little more money, yeah. and I have the counterparty reset my Lightning channel yeah. whenever I have to transact on chain yeah. anyway. So wouldn't that help me a lot increase the capacity of Lightning Network by using the on-chain payment for both the reset yes. and the payment? So we've, we've pretty much assumed something like that. Uh, what, what you have to take into account is that if you do two things with your transaction, your transaction is going to be larger. And so you're going to be paying for it more because you're paying per byte and not really per transaction. So in some sense, um, there are some constants that really need fine tuning in terms of, you know, there's a, probably a different size transaction for resetting a channel than for paying somebody. Uh, I don't really know. I'd like to see some lightning implementations and to really check. But that would, that would affect the model at the edges, right? There would be constants that we put in there. We, we just set them all to one because we didn't know what, what value to choose exactly. But okay. you're definitely right. Let's talk later. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, I've been thinking a lot about um, Lightning UX and how, the, how it'll affect transactions coming in and out of our exchange um, recently. And one thing that I was kind of wondering about and uh, was wondering if you had any insight on is what are your thoughts on uh, what you think transaction volume will be affected by people who want to send on-chain and like kind of similar to the last question, top up their channel or do yeah. some sort of channel op like, you know, um, like for instance, when you add a, a UTXO to the channel, you're just sending a normal transaction to a multisig um, on the blockchain. But at the same time, you could just be like, okay, adding this UTXO and saying that X amount is now the other person's stuff when you're adding it into the channel. So you would be sending on chain while at the same yep. time sending on the lightning channel so I was wondering if you had any like insights on what you think that would that would uh, appear on the blockchain once Lightning comes up, and whether you've kind of um, put that into your models at all. Yeah, so we've thought about this quite a lot, and there are a lot of these, a lot of interesting questions exactly there, um, uh, and it all if, depends, I guess, on how cooperative the other party is in the Lightning channel, right? Uh, so I'll say one thing, if you're pouring more money into the Lightning Channel, that's probably not, uh, not going to happen often because there's, you're just locking more and more money in there. Uh, people might do this, I'm sending my counterparty money directly and he's sending me something on the channel uh, to reset the channel and we're doing this in both layers kind of to, to reset. So this is something that we thought of instead of, our reset transactions are really one transaction rather than two. We didn't count them as two exactly because we were thinking of this scenario where everybody's trying to save money, right? So um, you're right, there's a lot of uh, technicalities there that would affect the model, but I think not very substantially at the core. Okay, so we're maybe the last really quick yeah. question, really quick answer. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, for your talk. Uh, you uh, researched uh, rough time of a channel and uh, you said uh, uh, network form uh, hub, right? Like a hub network is efficient, and um, I think uh, uh, so. Uh, payment uh, is a uh, 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 become a pa packet packet like payment. Then the uh, lifetime uh, channel lifetime is uh, longer, and the fee is uh, lower. So uh, what what kind of uh, uh, flat network and uh, packet like uh, payment. Uh, what, what do you think about it? So what I think, what do I think about uh, packet, uh, basically a routing uh, network? Yeah. yeah. So, so I think we, we, what we'll find is that, that they're uh, slightly more costly than, than the hub, right? The, ha the hub has two hops to get anywhere. Um, that's the appeal. Um, you only have, if you're, if you're holding a channel, all your channels are 10 bitcoins, for example, and that's what you need, you're, you're only going through two. If you have a, a uh, I think, more hops along the way, you're going to have more liquidity there to, to do the same thing. That's going to cost you in interest rates, right? So I think it will be higher. It's not going to be that high in, 
in the sense that it'll completely collapse all the value, but uh, when you, we will be thinking about com competitors, it, it might be that somebody who's, uh, ha who has shorter paths and, and less hops is more efficient economically. And so one of the concerns that I have is maybe Lightning will be slightly um, uh, centralizing in that sense, that less hops will be just cheaper to do. Um, and so if we have large players that form their hubs, uh, their own hubs, they, they, they will be more successful somehow. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, for our next talk, um, we have Andrew Palestra from Blockstream. He's gonna be talking about uh, using chains for what chains are good for. So kind of getting back to uh, one of those themes that Joey shared earlier this morning about using a tool that's fit for purpose. Hi, I'm Andrew Polstra. I'm a cryptographer at Blockstream. I'm going to talk a little bit about something I've been working on called scriptless scripts, but that's really just a specific example of a more general theme that I'd, I'd really like to talk about today, which is about using the blockchain um, as sort of a trust anchor or just as a commitment layer for your smart contracts whose real contents don't really hit the blockchain. And uh, I'll elaborate on what I mean by that and show some examples of how that works and, uh, and what the benefits of that are. So to give some context, right now, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Bitcoin, Bitcoin script, or Ethereum's EVM. This is a scripting language which is used to encode smart contracts which go onto a blockchain and everybody verifying the chain to learn where all of the coins are need to download and execute all of this contract code. Um, so everybody validating the chain, meaning everybody who wants to trustlessly learn what the state of the system is, needs to download this, parse it, validate it, um, and they can't really compress this or aggregate it. By nature, this is, this is code, it, it's more or less as small as this Kamalgarov complexity. There's not a whole lot you can do to make it smaller um, or to, to validate it in parallel or um, in an aggregate form. Additionally, for the contractors doing this, when they publish this to the network, before everyone can be assured that its state is not going to be reverted, the transaction needs to be confirmed. So it needs to go out to the network, they need to wait for another block, which happens according to some Poisson process. It's a long time, it's an unpredictable amount of time, and even once your transaction lands in a block, you need additional blocks, you get additional assurance, and you never have this, this finality, um, or, or never have perfect finality, I should say. Um, in addition to this, these contracts that are encoded in scripts have rules for executing these scripts which everybody needs to agree on. And changing these is a very big deal. This is what's called a consensus system. If there's any disagreement in the network about how scripts, what scripts are valid and which scripts are invalid, that will cause a disagreement on the history of the chain, a disagreement on the state of the chain, and, and that's a consensus failure. That can't happen, so everybody needs to agree on the rules beforehand which means that adding new functionality, doing cool new things, is often a very long, painful process, as I guess we've learned recently. Um, additionally, something that I, I personally care about is that the details of these scripts are visible to the public. They stay on the blockchain, they're there forever, so if people are doing some complicated contract amongst themselves, maybe they don't want that private information to be visible outside of their own group or outside of a, a fixed set of auditors. But when your contract execution is done by publishing the contract and having everybody execute it, that's impossible. Everybody sees a contract, it's committed in the chain, it needs to be kept around forever because future validators need to download it and process it. So uh, it's just pretty much the worst possible thing as far as uh, privacy. And related to this is that when transactions are collected into blocks, this is done by miners who have the technical ability to include or not include 
more or less whichever blocks, uh, whichever transactions they want to. And they're incentivized to always go with the, the highest fee things, but that incentive is only within the system. There are all sorts of external incentives. This is the one place in Bitcoin's security model where the real world can interact with it and really affect what's happening. So miners who can see the contract details are then a target for governments or other external pressures or external incentives. And, um, and they may not want that liability. If they have that liability, we, users of the system, uh, maybe don't want them to because that's the risk to, the risk to the users of the system for censorship is the risk to the miners for having liability that they don't want to have. Um, so, the, um, what I want to emphasize here is that all these contracts which are being executed by having this explicit code published to the blockchain are really only using the blockchain for one thing, and that is to get an immutable ordering of what order transactions happen in. All they really care about is that their transaction is not reversed, it's not double spent. All of the extra details of the contract execution could be done by things that are not blockchains. This is really the blockchain's core competency. And that's what I mean by my title, using chains for what they're good for, um, is that this is what needs to go on the blockchain. If we can, in principle, we should be able to avoid putting almost anything else beyond what inputs are being spent, which outputs are being created, or, or in an Ethereum model, which accounts are being deducted, which accounts are being incremented, uh, so forth. The, uh, the exact conditions under which this happened can be reduced in many cases to a very small amount of data that doesn't reveal what the actual commitments are. So, um, I guess philosophically, there's this distinction between validation and execution. And this comes, we see this in two places. In general computing science, uh, when you talk about Turing machines versus Turing deciders or something like that, uh, there's a theorem called Post Theorem, which shows that it is strictly easier to validate the correct uh, execution of some program than it is to execute it yourself. And the reason this is easier is that you can provide something called a witness, which basically gives some extra information dictating which direction various if branches will go on, what, uh, what the maximum resource limits are, and so on and so forth. Um, related to this, in crypto, um, we also talk about validation versus execution. And in, um, in computing science, we talk about this for efficiency reasons, or what, how expressive does a machine that verifies things need to be. In crypto, we care about this distinction because verification of something can often be done in what's called zero knowledge, where that extra helper data that I mentioned actually isn't revealed to anyone, but somehow through the magic of cryptography, everybody can verify that that extra data existed and it was correct. And that, that's what a zero knowledge proof or a zero knowledge argument is. And hopefully I can make that a little bit more, more uh, tangible in the next few slides. In addition to this execution versus verifiability distinction that I want to make, there is this verifiability versus public verifiability. And this is really the core of, of what I want to talk about, which is that the blockchain verifiers care very much about the state of the system. They care where the coins are, they care how many coins there are and what they're assigned to, who they're assigned to, and so on. When they see a transaction, which moves coins around, they care that that transaction was authorized, and they care that they all agree that the transaction was authorized, but really, they don't care too much about what that actually means. So when you're transacting, you care about your transaction being executed faithfully according to the rules that you want to enforce, but everybody else sort of doesn't care. What they care is that the money moved according to the rules of the system, there's no disagreement on that, and that whoever owned the money before somehow was okay with it moving, which is a much more nebulous thing than probably what the actual transactor cares about, which is specifically such and such signed off on it at such and such a time and, and so on. So there's kind of a general way to do contracting, which Adam Gibson talked about in a recent blog post, or a upcoming blog post, where you can imagine instead of doing some complicated Ethereum contract or building a series of Bitcoin scripts, Suppose that you care about money moving just under some external conditions. What you can do is move all of your coins to a multi-signature output where everybody who cares about the final outcome of these coins uh, has to sign off on them moving again. 
you, when you're setting this up, you have to set up a refund transaction that's locked time so that if anything goes wrong, it backs out, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, and then whatever these external conditions are that this group of signers cares about, each one of them individually checks that those conditions are met, and only then do they sign off. And so what the blockchain validators check is that all the signatures are present. That's all that they check. They don't know what those external conditions are. They don't care what the external conditions are. They don't need to verify what they are. They don't need to download a description of them or anything like that. Okay. So, suppose though that the conditions these signers want to enforce are not just external things about the world that they can look at and, um, and agree on whether or not they've happened. Suppose they're trying to enforce conditions on each other. So something like, um, the classic example is an atomic ex exchange between blockchains. Suppose I want to give money to somebody uh, in exchange, I want to give Bitcoins to them in exchange for Ethereum coins. And Bitcoin and Ethereum have different blockchains. Um, me and the, my counterparty both need to sign off to move these coins on each chain. And there's a risk that if I sign to give my coins away, my counterparty won't sign to give me my coins, and then I lose, and vice versa. So somehow we have to sign simultaneously. And that's what I mean by, by signers enforcing conditions on each other. And I'll talk about in the next slide how to do that. Um, so you can do this in Bitcoin script or in Ethereum or, or what have you in a classic way that's due to Tier Nolan, where in order to take your coins, you need to reveal a hash pre-image. And on both blockchains, it's required that revealing this hash pre-image is done. So initially, one person actually knows what the hash pre-image is. The other one doesn't. They sign to take their coins. To do that, they reveal a hash pre-image, which they do by creating a blockchain script that says these coins may not move until something is revealed to the blockchain, which hashes to this fixed value. So that person reveals a hash image to take their coins. At that point, the other person can just read the hash pre-image hash pre off the public blockchain, copy it to the second blockchain, and take their coins. And atomicity is achieved in this way. But, um, but this, is, this is no good. I mean, it, it links the two transactions because they're the same hash challenge pre-image on both blockchains. It's inefficient. It's forcing all of these verifiers, the, everybody in the world, to download that hash, download the pre-image, check that they match in order to see that the coins move. And those verifiers really don't care about this. There's really only two people who care about what this hash pre-image is. And those are the two transactors. And even they only care about it temporarily while they're executing this uh, atomic exchange. Once the money's moved on both ends, really nobody cares anymore, but the data's still there forever. So, I um, have been working on a way to do scripts in kind of an invisible off-chain way, something called scriptless scripts, where this, this so-called witness data, which in an atomic exchange is like a hash pre-image, is hidden inside of the signatures themselves. So blockchain validators always need to check signatures. That's really the, the only thing that that uh, gives a form of authorization that's unique to a single person or some specific party. So validators are already checking these signatures. So my question is, or, or my, my program here is, is how much extra validation can we overload these signatures with? And can we do it in a way that people validating the signatures don't know about it, but people producing the signatures do? Okay. So um, that's, that's scriptless scripts. Um, you might think that this is limited in power, because I, I'm, I'm talking about taking something very simple, digital signatures, and trying to add a whole bunch of extra semantics to them. As it turns out, you can do a whole lot with these things. Um, and historically, this came from the Mimblewimble project, which is a blockchain design that doesn't have support for any of these explicit scripts. So there was an open question after this Mimblewimble thing appeared. Uh, how, do we, how do we do any sort of contracting? How can we do atomic exchanges? How can we do lightning? The answer, uh, or one answer, turned out to be scriptless scripts. And that's where this idea came from, but it turns out it's applicable to Bitcoin as well. It's applicable to anything, um, with one, one minor exception, which is that most of what I'm doing requires that we have support for Schnorr signatures on the chain. So there's this one extra opcode that would be needed for most of this stuff, but it's, it's a fairly minor thing. It doesn't add any new semantics to, to the system. It just creates an alternate um, EC signature algorithm that people can choose to use if they want to. So, Benedict yesterday talked about Schnorr signatures, um, so I'm, not, I'm going to try to avoid algebra as much as I can. I think there's one equation in here and it's just a plus sign. It's not, 
so it's, it's okay. Um, but a neat, a neat feature of these Schnorr signatures, which Benedict gave all the algebra of, is that you can create multi-signatures with two parties or, or any number of parties, which look the same to validators of signal signatures. And they do this by interactively producing a signature on a joint signing key. So each one has an individual signing key, they add these together, and then interactively they're able to produce a signature. And a cool feature of this that I'm going to exploit is that when they're doing this interaction, they first agree on the first half of the signature, something called a nonce, which is like an ephemeral temporary pub key. And then once they've agreed on the nonce, at that point they actually produce the real signature. Um, and I'm going to exploit these two steps of interaction and start sticking a bunch of extra semantics between those two steps, between the signers. That's what I'm going to, and this will never hit the chain. What hits the chain will just be the signature. But it turns out we can do some cool things in, uh, in the space between signers. So, the tool that I'm going to use for this, and here's my one equation, you can see there's R, okay, it's two. There's an R plus T and there's an S plus T. But, okay. Um, what we're going to do is create what I call an adapter signature, where these two Schnorr signatures, or rather the two components of these Schnorr signatures, can be modified, they can be tweaked in such a way by adding some random number, which I'm calling T here. They can be tweaked in such a way that you can get a real signature knowing the secret value T, and knowing the secret value T, you can get a real signature. So, so somehow knowledge of this value T, uh, little t, becomes like a key to producing the signature. And the way this is done is with this this thing called an adapter signature. And it's really, you just take a valid signature, you add this random value, to value t to it. Because t is random, the resulting adapter signature will be random, uniformly random, I should say. It's uncorrelated with the original signature. It doesn't provide any useful information, but somebody can verify that it is actually an adapter signature. And they have this public big T here, which they use to, to uniquely identify the little t that they'll learn. So let me, let me try to, to say that in a specific instance here. This is how you do an atomic exchange. So imagine we have two parties, Alice and Bob. Uh, they want to do this atomic exchange where Bob sends Alice some coins on Bitcoin, Alice sends Bob coins on Ethereum. They want to make sure that if Alice gets her coins, then Bob will get them and vice versa. Uh, otherwise, neither of them do. So they both put coins on the respective chains into two of two outputs, so they both have to sign. Now, before Alice signs to give Bob his coins, she asks him for two adapter signatures with the same adapter signature key, big T, here. Um, she asks for adapter signatures on both of his contributions to the signatures on each chain. And what this means is that if Alice learns one of his signatures, she can learn the secret little t. If Alice learns the secret little t, she can compute both of his signatures, okay? So as soon as Bob gives Alice these adapter signatures, at that point, Bob is safe. So he's going to sign to, um, sorry, Bob is going to sign to take his coins. So Bob has given Alice the adapter signatures. Alice will sign to give Bob the coins. Then Bob signs to take them. As soon as Bob signs to take his coins, Alice learns T, little t, from the adapter signature. She then uses that little t to learn Bob's other signature, which is giving her coins. She then adds her contribution to that signature and she takes the coins. So there are two transactions, both of them sign them, but it was structured so that as soon as Bob signed the one giving him money, Alice has some secret information that she could use to take her money. And what's cool about this um, are a number of things. I'm going to skip this because I'm, I'm a little tight on time. Um, or I'll, I'll come back to it briefly. So there are a whole bunch of cool features about using adaptive signatures in this way, basically in place of hash preimages. One is that these discrete log um, challenges, that's what this is, I'm calling it a hash preimage, but I'm actually making it a discrete log challenge. Uh, these have a bunch of extra structure, like all sorts of extra cool structure. One is that you can make them work across uh, elliptic curves with some extra cryptography that I'll, I'll publish in the next few months. Um, so you still, you get the ability to do this kind of cool stuff, even if you have some blockchain like Bitcoin or Ethereum using SecP256K1, and some other blockchain like, like Monero or, or Sia coin using Ed25519, you can still do this. The adapter signatures are undetectable and deniable. That's really the core feature. 
What winds up hitting the chain are just these normal signatures, normal looking Schnorr signatures. This off chain interaction where Alice secretly, or Bob secretly reblinded these and passed them to Alice, that's undetectable and it's also what's called deniable. Meaning that after the fact, anybody can take any two signatures on any blockchains whatsoever, produce some, some extra T, reblind them by just adding stuff to them and say, hey, look, this was an adapter signature protocol. And that's indistinguishable from a real adapter signature protocol. There's no evidence that this happened at all. Um, so this is, this is really good for privacy. Um, this is good for fungibility at all, um, as well, because it means that coins that are used for, for various protocols like this are indistinguishable from coins that are used just for normal peer-to-peer -peer protocols. Um, and then an additional, additional cool feature that uh, I've talked about more in other talks that focus more on scriptless scripts is that they're reblindable. So I'll briefly talk about this, this lightning thing. Um, do I have a point? So you can chain not just two transactions together. You can um, not just making two transactions atomic. You can make arbitrary chains of transaction atomic. I can make so when I give, um, when Alice gives money to Bob, that transaction only happens if Bob gives money to Carol, only happens if Carol gives money to David, and so on. And I can make all of these hops happen uh, atomically. And this is how, this is what Lightning is based on, is the ability to link these payment channels and then you can produce these routes knowing that there is no risk of, of coins being stolen because everything happens atomically. It either, either the money goes all the way or it doesn't go anywhere at all. And there's a privacy issue with using hash pre-images for this, which is a standard way to do this, where one party reveals the hash pre-image and every other party along the hops sees the hash pre-image and copies it. Using adapter signatures, you can actually reblind it. So every hop has a different challenge, which they are able to translate from their challenge into the challenge they want accepted. And that's, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but the result is that these four participants in a lightning path are unable to tell without complete con collusion, um, are unable to tell that they are part of the same path at all, even given the extra data. So there's nothing, nothing that hits the chain that they can use to identify it, no hashes they can, they can look at to identify it. But even given the secret external data that they're passing around amongst each other to make this atomic exchange work, even then, each path, or each hop in the path involves uniformly random data that's uncorrelated with any other hop in that path or any other, uh, any other path. And that's a, that's a really cool thing for privacy. That's a great thing for privacy on Lightning, which is another thing that I think about. Um, and that, uh, that's all that I have to say. So I'll stop there. So thank you. Do we have time for questions? Yes, green. Uh, so you, you made it work for two of two. Is it possible to do like a three of three or mo more than that you, utilizing the same math here? Yes, absolutely. So not only can you do three of three or N of N, you can actually do M of N. Um, so Benedict briefly, briefly talked in his talk yesterday about Schnorr threshold signatures. You can do these threshold signature tricks and that is 100% compatible with these sorts of things. So you can create more complicated multi-party protocols where each individual party is revealing different things to different people. Um, and, and they could have like different weird structure to their adapter signatures. So. Okay. And uh, uh, so just, just for clarity's sake, uh, you said that Bob has uh, little, uh, little T and big T. He reveals, uh, he, uh, Alice asks for big T from him and then when he signs, he reveals little t. How does that actually get revealed? Oh, sure. So, um, so Alice asks Bob for big T. Mm -hmm. Bob gives uh, Alice big T along with a valid signature plus little t. Okay. So that is that S, S plus T right here. Okay. So, and, uh, okay, S plus T. Yeah, so now once you know S plus T, mm -hmm. if you learn either S, which is a real signature, mm -hmm. or if you learn T, you can get the other one. Right, right, just by subtracting. Right, so, so the signature oh. actually will... Uh, yeah, exactly. So there, there's an additional thing given besides big T. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yep. So okay. that, that's, that's the critical. That is the adapter signature, is S plus T. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks. So going off of just what Jimmy said there, when t, little t is revealed, doesn't that uh, give a form of linkability between the two uh, like atomic swaps in your example, I guess? No, and the reason is that... 
after the signature is on the chain, um, so there's, there's little s hits the chain, anybody can make up some, some little t here, and the corresponding big T. Add, um, I guess, add little t to the signature, subtract big T from the nonce that hits the chain, and pretend like it, it wasn't really r plus t, it was actually some other r plus t. Um, and you can do that with any t that you want. Okay. There, there, there's actually independent, um, and there's, no, there's nothing tying this particular t to s plus t. Can you just talk about the storage and the transaction throughput implications of this approach? Sure. Um, so there are two. So there, there are two pieces to that. One is using these Schnorr multi-signatures means that multiple signatures are combined into one. That's a necessary prerequisite for that. So that means that a signature on uh, any transaction input would be reduced from 60, uh, 128 bytes to two separate signatures of 64, just one signature. In addition to that, if you're doing something like an atomic swap, which requires a hash and its pre-image, which would be something like another 64 bytes, that doesn't hit the chain at all. So in this atomic swap uh, example, rather than having, I guess, about 200 bytes of data, which consists of a multi-signature plus a hash plus a pre-image, uh, that's entirely collapsed into one signature, which is 64 bytes. And then on top of that, there's an additional thing that I've been working on outside of this called aggregate signatures, which allows that 64 bytes to be compressed into 32. Um, so, so it's the input signature, the witness data, that's compressed quite dramatically here. Um, but the rest of the transaction remains the same. The shape of the transaction is the same. So this feels like it's related to uh, Taj Dreja's uh, stuff yesterday on discrete log contracts. He did kind of a similar trick is it, is it related? Yeah, I, I uh, would love if Taj would describe his thing as a scriptless script so that I can pretend like I have a big wide umbrella. Um, I, I consider it to be a, an example of a scriptless script. Um, so what I focused on in this talk was these adapter signatures and a couple of cool things you can do with adapter signatures. But there are some other things. One is these discrete log contracts. Another one is pay to contract, sign to contract. Um, there's some, some other stuff that I've been working on that, that hopefully will be public in the next few months. Um, but I wanted to focus on this because I just wanted to give an example of what, um, of what hiding contracts off of the chain and just leaving a signature on the chain. I just wanted to give an example of what that looked like to motivate that paradigm. Cool, thank you. Great, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> And as always, I expect people have more questions, so grab Andrew during the break or during lunch. We're actually gonna go to break now. We're gonna be taking a 15 minute break. We'll be back at 11.10. When we get back, we'll have um, micro chains, incentives and trade-offs and transaction selection in DAG-based protocols, and changes without unanimous consent.
Next up here, he's going to be talking about microchains, which are a proposed system to address major challenges related to scalability, upgradability, competing consensus implementations, and utility token speculation. <laughs> right? Almost. Uh, Close. So, so they can do all those things, uh, but I had to, and I'm not sure what button to push. But I limited the talk. All right. Okay. I limited the talk to uh, just a little piece so that we could finish in time. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm proposing today is called microchains. It is a, what I hope will be a solution that gives us large layer one scalability, um, you know, on the order of like 100x or 1,000x. And we could see a blockchain ecosystem with thousands of transactions per second at layer one uh, with, with full security. Um, and so we have to look at blockchain really, different, really differently if we're going to, to achieve this. Um, so a brief introduction. My name is David Vorek. I've uh, been, been studying Bitcoin since 2011. Uh, my primary gig is Zaya, which is a decentralized cloud storage platform. Um, and I, I spend a lot of time working with uh, consensus algorithms and proof of work and like trying to imagine if we started over, what sorts of things could we do today that we didn't know about um, a lot, you know, in 2008. Um, and so today, um, I want to approach, or I want to present a new way to think about blockchains and a new way to think about game theory um, that will allow us to depart from the traditional security assumptions of Bitcoin um, and, and really to present a new way to uh, secure transactions against double spends um, without considering the 51% attack uh, threat model. Um, and so the, the, let's see what, okay. So the general idea here is to get scalability, we're gonna, we're gonna switch from these large monolithic ginormous chains where everybody has to do a ton of validation to a very large number of tiny chains um, that every user is on a large number of these chains, uh, say like 20 or 100, or, or, but there are millions of them total. And so every user is validating a small fraction of the ecosystem as a whole. And yet using layer two protocols like Lightning, um, cross-chain cross Lightning, any user anywhere in the network can send a transaction to any user anywhere else in the network. Um, and, and so the hope is that by breaking the chains apart, we can reduce validation costs and um, increase the overall scale of the blockchain ecosystem. And we already see this a little bit. Uh, for example, you have Bitcoin and Ethereum and Litecoin and, and so on and so on. And if you set up the, a lightning network between them, users on any chain can send money to any other chain without verifying every transaction in the whole ecosystem. Um, and so this is sort of taking that to a larger extreme. Uh, the biggest issue, though, is if you're going to have a million chains that all have separate currencies, separate proofs of work, uh, is that 51% attacks become really easy. Uh, if we're talking about chains that have, say, market caps of like $10,000 or $100,000, um, you only need like a couple GPUs or, or maybe ASICs, but, but, you know, one person could easily afford enough hardware to go out and 51% attack one of these chains. Um, and so what I want to do is present a way that we can work with these chains to make them safe against double spend attacks, even though they can be trivially 51% attacked. Uh, and so to do this, we're gonna need three new prerequisites uh, that, that I'm gonna walk through. Uh, so the first thing that I want to introduce is the idea of open mining, which is Miners, instead of just hashing and getting, getting whatever rewards they can, they also have like some API or some method where you can give a miner any header, just a random header, pay the miner and say solve this. And so as long as you pay the miner more than whatever they're making, doing whatever they're already doing, they have this incentive to go ahead and solve the header for you. They can return a solved header and have no idea uh, what chain they just solved the header for or what, what transactions are in it or what, what they did. Um, and so we want, we want this system where we can just go and pay for hash rate uh, and without having to own the hardware ourselves. 
The second prerequisite we're going to need uh, is high full node participation. So we want pretty much every user to run a full node that has a lot of uptime. Um, and I think a good example of, of a high uptime device that pretty much everyone has is your cell phone. And so if these chains are tiny enough that you can run full nodes on your cell phone without impacting your battery life, without slowing the phone down, without uh, you know, using up all your data, um, then I think that it's actually reasonable that we could see chains with where the majority of nodes are full nodes and everybody's fully validating. And, and to get this to work, that you really need that. Um, and then finally, we have this, this third idea of mutual discouragement, which is if you're on a chain and you see attack, an, an attack happen successfully, you just sort of lose faith in that chain and you stop transacting on it. You certainly stop buying coins. Maybe you sell off. Um, and, and so you, uh, yeah, you just lose faith in the chain. Um, so open mining is not that bad of a prerequisite. I think that it's pretty reasonable if there's, if there's a substantial amount of money to be made by, by just opening up your hardware and, and accepting payments to do random hashing, I think miners would uh, be comfortable doing that. Um, and so, yeah, if, if miners are making more revenue, I, th I think they would implement it. Uh, high participation, this is probably like the hardest prerequisite to get. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know, users typically don't run full nodes, and I would hope that we could set up a system where, where it would be easy and they, they, there just wouldn't be SPV nodes, you would just have to run a full node and it wouldn't, nobody would feel the need to make one. Um, and then finally, for mutual discouragement, I think this would work because you have lots of chains. So if you see one of, if, if every user is on like 50 chains and one of their chains gets attacked, you probably don't, like, you don't want to be on that chain anymore anyway, and it's not that big of a loss to you. And so I think that, I think that users would be comfortably on board, and there's this sort of like revenge component to the human psyche uh, that I think that we could tap into. Um, so I am going, oh, okay, okay. I don't know how to go back. Here we go. So the advantage of open mining is that any user can 51% attack any chain. And if we're talking about an ecosystem where you have like a million chains and you have miners and hash rate power for a million chains and all of this hash rate power can just be bought at any time, um, you, can, you can dump like the entire market cap of a coin uh, worth of proof of work on it in like two hours. Um, so like the Bitcoin equivalent would, would just be like redoing the entire chain like 10 times over in the space of two hours um, in work. And so if you have the ability, it's, it's not just, like it's not just attackers who have the ability to do this, it's defenders as well. So anybody can come and dump as much mining onto any chain that they want whenever they want, which means if you see an attacker coming in and trying to do a double spend or a reorg, you can actually add work to the, to the honest side of the chain um, to defend it. And this is, going to, this is going to be ultimately what pulls everything together. Um, so the reason that we need high participation and, and lots of full nodes is because if you, come on, if you come online in the middle of an attack, you actually have no idea which, you, you can see that there's a double spend, there are two chains and like, like they're conflicting, one's trying to win, you have no idea which one was originally there, that's very hard to prove. Uh, but if you're online all the time, then you can see a spend happen and maybe after six hours if someone tries to do a double spend, you're aware of which one was original. Um, and I think that the only way to be able to tell in the middle of an attack and even after an attack which side was, was the original, like the good guys, is if you've been watching the whole time. And so that's why we need this, this high participation. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna get into how we, how we actually prevent our double spends. Um, and the first, like, most basic thing we can do is a simple scorched earth game where if you're doing a double spend as an attacker, you're stealing from somebody. And if the defender is online watching this attack, they have motivation, and again, like, sort of revenge motivation, so perhaps they are more motivated than the attacker to try and defend it and protect their payment. And this, so if the attacker has to deal with a motivated defender who can also dump work onto the chain, the incentive goes down for the attacker and it's, it's very likely that at the end, 
the attacker has lost money, the defender has lost money, as a net, everybody's out. Um, and so that's not like fantastic, but it means that the incentive to attack has been reduced. Um, but more interesting is this mutual discouragement thing, where if I'm online and I'm watching an attacker and a defender battle, and then I see the attacker win, I'm like, okay, well, if, if the attacker can win once, he can probably win a bunch of times. Like, my coins probably aren't valuable. Um, if I receive new coins, they might be double spent. It might be the same attacker. And so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sell off. Um, and so if you have a bunch of participants on your network selling off simultaneously, and if everybody's watching, that means the miners are watching, the exchanges are watching, any, any big player is watching, and everybody just switches to selling coins, the immediate thing, no, nobody's buying coins, the immediate like value for the coin turns to zero. So the attacker who just did a double spend to steal some of these coins stole nothing. Like, like maybe they got the coins, but the coins are now worthless. Um, and so this is a second really charged like disincentive for an attacker to try and engage a, in, in a double spend. And then the final thing that we can do is that if I am sitting on the chain and I have like say $50 of you know, coins on this chain and I see an attack in progress, I, if, if I know that if the attacker wins, that $50 is going to be worth approximately $0 because of this mutual discouragement thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna want to sell them off, but nobody's gonna want to buy them, and so I can't get anything for them. I have $50 of motivation to help the defender. And so the approximate outcome is that the entire market cap of the coin is motivated to assist the defender any time there's an attack, um, so long as enough people are paying attention to step in. And so the result is this really interesting like game theory mechanism where an attacker is just, e even if a chain has a low amount of work over time, an attacker has like an overwhelming barrier to commit a successful double spend. Um, and I think that this is just a fascinating idea. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and make, make one more observation, which is that if you have really tiny chains, you don't need transaction pools or mempools. Um, so if, if all of our chains are really tiny and we just have a huge number of them, uh, you don't need a transaction pool anymore. You can do one transaction per block. It's not gonna overwhelm these chains because their throughput is really low anyway. Um, and so when you wanna make a transaction, instead of like waiting for someone to mine a block, you just mine a block yourself automatically. And that has utility to you in the sense that you don't have to pay the fee if you're the one mining the block. And that means that the people paying for most of the work on the chain are going to be the users because miners can at most make the block reward. If there's no transaction pool and if you can't claim transaction fees, you are at a disadvantage as an economic party trying to mine on the chain. You are at a, at a disadvantage compared to people who are making transactions because they have extra utility for mining than, than just a professional miner. Um, and so we get rid of all the, all the headache associated with transaction pools and transaction fees and, and all of that. And then we also like sort of decentralize uh, the mining component a lot more in the sense of the hash rate may all still be in one place, but the people paying to do the proof of work, um, the actual, yeah, the actual like powerhouse behind the proof of work is, is a lot more decentralized among the people who are doing the transactions. Um, and so finally, I think that Another like big advantage to microchains is that they are anti-fragile in the sense that if I'm on 200 chains and somewhere over there in the million chain ecosystem, things are like melting down and, and just going completely wrong, that doesn't affect me at all. Um, as long as my like chains are, you know, whatever, whatever part of the ecosystem I'm in, as long as that's intact, it doesn't matter if, if things elsewhere are melting and that means that if we try and spread this out over a broad set of use cases, I can imagine that some of the use cases are going to have an easier time getting high participation. For example, if it's you know, a, bunch of, a bunch of banks doing business with each other or just, just corporate uh, you know, businesses in general, it's a lot easier for a business 
to run full-time nodes, even if it takes a lot of power, than it is for users. And so you might see use cases where, where businesses can fit into this game theory model a lot easier than um, you know, everyday users. And this is something that we could experiment with over time and, or even simultaneously. And, it, and, it, and if one set of use cases ends up not working out, it doesn't affect the rest of the use cases. And so with a microchains environment, you can do a lot of, I guess, aggressive experimentation. And because they're small chains that don't influence each other, um, it's, yeah, you, you, can, you, you don't have to worry about every single soft fork or every single upgrade being absolutely perfect. You can, you can iterate more rapidly and just, just make more chains every time you have more ideas. Um, and so I would propose that if we were to make this, uh, we would brand it just like Bitcoin in the very early days was always, always branded as extremely experimental, like high risk, don't you know, expect to lose money if you put in. Um, and, then, and then we could just start, start playing around with potential microchains. And because they are supposed to be secure at very low market caps due to, due to the game theory incentives, um, it's, it's not risky to, to play around with them, even, even if you're just, even if the whole market cap of the thing is like 10 bucks, um, you know, you, you still might be able to see some of the game theory play out. Okay, so that's, that's the end of my talk, and I can take some questions. So uh, these micro chains feel a bit like the uh, value in the original Ryan Fugger's uh, Ripple system where the value of what you have depends on your network and your friends and how well they will support you uh, in the end. And so how, how would one discover the correct price if you and I want to do cross-chain swap your coin for mine? Yeah, so the price would have to be handled by uh, a bunch of layer two infrastructure. I would say that you would want multiple market makers to be on every chain who are independent. Um, and then basically you, just, you would just ask the market makers who sort, of, who sort of trade them all day, what's the best price you can give me? And if there are a large enough, mar an, a large enough number of market makers on your chain, it's unlikely that they'll all be colluding to give you an unfair price. Um, or if there's, a if there's a wide spread, at the very least, that spread will be visible. Um, and so you can, you can tune your trading according to you know, what, what makes sense given the liquidity and spread. And so I think, I think that's all handled with like layer two supply and demand mechanics. That's interesting. It feels like the worth of your chain would be based on its uh, previous attack history and how many of your friends and and uh, cohorts came to your defense. Yeah, I think so. I think that if you had a chain with a history of several attacks uh, that it successfully defended, it would be worth probably a lot more than a chain that had never been tested or obviously, if it, I mean, once a chain fails once, it's probably dead forever. Um, and I also think that there may even be a reason to attack a chain. You may want to attempt a double spend on your own chain just to verify that the network is on standby and to verify that it's coming through. And you as an attacker are gonna lose, right? You're gonna spend money mining blocks that are going to be displaced by, by like the network's immune system. But it might be worth throwing those blocks away to confirm that the network has a working, like a functioning immune system. I think a lot of this, you're making assumptions that you can actually go see an attack happen, which is essentially an assumption that you're not being civil attacked. Now in Bitcoin, proof of work, one of its purposes is to allow you to detect civil attacks. How do you think that's going to work with microchains where the cost of you know, creating enough work to successfully do a civil attack will of course be much lower? So in terms of attack visibility, I think, I think the only assumption that we really need is that you are connected to, to the full chain. Um, and so if you're, if you're on the peer-to-peer -peer network and there's no, like there's no partition between peers, then any, either you know about all the work that has happened or there's work that's being kept secret from everybody. And if that work is being kept secret from everybody is suddenly revealed, 
that's your attack. And so, so you can detect the attack by the, suddenly a large amount of work being revealed that causes a reorganization, and you have, you have to assume that there's no network partition, and I think, I think that if you were able to partition a network and, and have two nodes hiding from each other, when you, or two, two networks not talking to each other, making chains, when you combine them, both of their immune systems will react and see the attack, and that would probably, probably end the chain. So essentially a similar um, assumption to what proof of stake makes. Yes. Uh, although I, I would say it's better than proof of stake in a lot of other ways. <laughs> Namely, uh, one huge benefit that this has is if I'm bootstrapping to a network, um, I have absolute certainty by the amount of proof of work on a chain that I am on the, that I have bootstrapped to the right chain, whereas proof of stake has the uh, costless history problem that, that this does not. Just to clarify, every microchain would have uh, his own uh, coin, right? And you exchange across, uh, with the cross-chain uh, swaps. Yeah, uh, so every, every microchain would have a completely separate currency and a separate price and potentially even separate consensus rules. And then you would exchange between them, presumably using a multi-chain lightning network. I think, I think that would be the like, least painful way to set up an economy of a bunch of independent chains. Yeah, okay, good. thank you. Uh, I have a question about, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's a, sorry about that. I have a question about, um, like, isn't it, won't there be kind of a setup cost to create each of these new chains? There will be, I'm imagining that you have lots of these small chains involved, but I think creating a new one, it would be like new people will have to go over there first and then they'll have to set up channels with each other and you'll have to hope that it all kind of overlaps. And I'm not sure that that, don't you think that would get kind of expensive? Because you need to have, to do lightning across chains, you need to have the same two people have a channel with each other on both chains. And that just seems um, expensive. So if the chains are really tiny, um, it's just code. And, and the amount of code that you need to run to set up some channels and stuff, uh, shouldn't, you know, it, yeah, it should happen put, in milliseconds. money over there. And then you have to open the channel. So the money, the money would essentially, when you make a new chain, uh, the money like comes from nowhere. And so it has to have, that, that money has to have some reason to exist and some value, right? And so the, where that value would come from is the parties. So I, w I would see a new chain like being formed when either one chain fills up or, or some group of people agree like, hey, it would, it would be better if we had another chain. And so they just, they sort of enter this mutual like, Genesis I'm agreement. Saying, like, imagine you want to create another chain tomorrow. You're saying that we mm -hmm. create it with a bunch of, it's basically an altcoin, you create it with a bunch of pre-mined money over there already that goes to some people and they open channels with each other and then you're just hoping that, hoping that they have, correspond to people who have channels open on Bitcoin today and then they can sw switch with each other. You see what I mean? So, Do you understand what I'm saying? Imagine we try to create one of these tomorrow. Yeah, so, so assuming the that... The cost is not just running the code, you know. It's like everyone's attention and the money that goes over there. That's what I'm trying to say. Right, and so, and so yes, chains are not free. Um, and so it, it, it would, if a chain is going to exist, it has to have a reason to exist. And either that's because some existing chain has, has started to have material fees or some existing chain, you don't trust it because you know one guy owns 60% of the coins or... Um, but yeah, I would, I would say that's... Um, on the earlier side of, of the research is figuring out at what point do you make new chains. Hey David, uh, really cool idea. And <clears throat> it makes me think intuitively about um, what's happening currently with all the Bitcoin forks. How do you feel about it? It seems like exactly what you're describing. You started with one example of the technology and now people are, people are like smaller market caps, more experimental algorithms and whatnot. So in general, I'm a pretty big fan of forks. Um, I think I think it has this like nice benefit where like we we want our thing and you want your thing, and instead of like fighting all the time, you just like go over and do your thing, or we go over and do our thing, and and then like we don't have to fight anymore. Um, the problem with doing this, like uh, just just for an example, Bitcoin Cash. Even if I preferred the Bitcoin Cash chain. 
knowing that it's got not much hash rate um, and like I'm, I wouldn't be as confident in the security of my money on Bitcoin Cash as I would on Bitcoin because they don't have these, the, the game theory around it is not as strong um, and, and there are these like giant 51% attackers and the same applies to pretty much any GPU mined altcoin that's not Ethereum. You just, you just have this, you know, if you're not in the top 10 on the market cap, there are probably dozens of mining facilities that have enough GPUs to 51% attack your coin at will, and what incentives do they have to not to? Like, they don't, they don't care if they wipe out your coin. Uh, if, they make, if they make money, they make money. So, I, yeah, I think, I think that forks are the right direction, but I think that we need to think about the security of being on minority chains, and so this is really an attempt to improve the uh, security and reliability of, of tiny, tiny chains. So can I follow uh, that sorry. up really quick? Yeah, we're over time, sorry. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. So thank you, David. Uh, our next talk here is about incentives and trade-offs in transaction selection in DAG-based protocols. Um, do we have Yonatan or you? Okay, great. Um, Yonatan Sompolinsky from the Hebrew University. Give it to you, but it's Whatever. nine seconds. Because okay. you just sent it. Okay, thank you. So uh, my name is Jonathan Sampolinski. I'm a PhD student in the Hebrew University under the supervision of Aviv Zohar, which talked uh, previously. And also I'm a co-founder and scientist at uh, DAG Labs, which is a commercial effort to implement uh, DAG-based protocols. And I feel comfortable here to say that we're not doing an ICO. It's a regular company. Um, okay, so this proposal was, was um, uh, prepared together with Joao Dornberg, my colleague, uh, both in Hebrew University and in DAG Labs. Okay, so a bit of background about DAG-based protocols. Um, okay, this is. No. Okay, um, Anton, I think the screen should be. Okay, so. Um, That's, a, that's the screen. Okay, so can we put this the main one? No, I, it's, it is there. Yeah. It's just when you go, when you go next. Mm. So that's, this is not here. Okay, that's the. Strange. Just one second, please. It's more and more functions. Anyways, I'll continue. Hold on a sec. 
Okay, so let's continue. So um, the, the background to this work is a line of works we've done in the Hebrew University. Um, my colleague, as, as again, Yoad Lundberg and Aviv Zohar, my supervisor. And this idea of, of block DAG is a modification of the layer one of, of Bitcoin, of blockchain. Thanks. And um, so it's a generalization of the chain structure of the of blockchain. And as such, okay, thanks. So um, it's orthogonal to any layer two solutions. So Lightning Network and all micropayment chan channels, etc. cetera. Um, so we're scaling up layer one. You guys are um, um, scaling up layer two. These are complementary solutions. And the, the, this talk will be focused on an idea that we developed in the inclusive blockchain paper um, in 2015. And we kind of revisited these ideas now because we're heading up to, to scale up to implement these block days, block DAGs protocols. So roughly what is a, a blockchain versus a block DAG? So the first um, uh, 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 difference is that in a chain you maintain a single chain and obviously in a DAG you maintain an entire graph of blocks. The second uh, difference would be that in a chain you ignore anything that's off chain any, any data that wasn't <clears throat> didn't appear in the chain, whereas in the DAG, you use all this information, of, you, you, you harvest all information from all blocks. And the third implication is that in a, chain, in a chain paradigm, you try to suppress the throughput so that forks are rare, spontaneous forks are rare in, in the system, whereas in a block DAG system, forks are the common phenomena of the system, the common development of the system is that many, many forks are created in parallel. And as you can ima imagine, this, this is essentially a matter of information. In a chain paradigm, you ignore everything that's off-chain. In a DAG paradigm, you use in th this entire information. And this information can be used for more scalability, more security, more fairness, but the fact that it's, it can be used to, to, the, to these stuff doesn't mean that every block DAG protocol uh, uses this, these stuff. So just to drop a name, uh, Ethereum's uh, Ghost version um, mostly uses Ghost for fairness, less for scalability. Okay, so just to give an example of a DAG-based protocol that um, doesn't use these entire features. Okay, so what's the road to scaling up layer one using DAGs? The first step would be simply to speed up block creation so instead of one block per 10 minutes, as in Bitcoin, or one block per 21 seconds, as in Ethereum, imagine 10 blocks per second, 50 blocks per second, um, maybe more. So that's step number one. And of course, the immediate implication is that we have spontaneous forks to the chain, many, many forks. And so the, the second step would be to modify the mining protocol. And now instead of every block extending a single chain, you want every block referencing these entire um, blocks, every, all the tips that it sees, integrating this, these forks into one graph. So as you can see, you have this massive uh, cool graph. This is a DAG, directed acyclic graph. So everything seems very simple so far, but we haven't reached yet the final step, the third step, which is the most crucial one, namely extracting a consistent set of, a consistent set of transactions from this graph. So this graph co contains conflicts, many conflicts possibly, and we must take this graph and somehow extract from it an order. This is the main challenge of a block DAG effort. Um, and we developed a Spectre protocol to address this challenge. Um, I actually spoke about Spectre two years ago in Scaling Bitcoin Hong Kong. We didn't call it Spectre, we call it, I think, a past future, past future, something like that. Um, so this will not be a, a talk about Spectre. I'm just highlighting that this is the main challenge in developing a block DAG protocol, the consistency rule. And in light of that, I want to clear some misconception that block DAG is not a solution. It's merely a framework above which one can design good protocols or bad protocols. So you can't just say I'm using a, a block DAG solution. This is, this is uh, not defined well. And consequently, not all black DAGs, block DAGs are created equal. I already mentioned Ethereum uses some notion of a DAG um, partially, and other, you, you can design uh, other variants. 
And I like to think of a DAG versus a chain. You know, the chain is like a slow, one single lane road in a small town, whereas a DAG is a, is a highway, super powerful highway. And the first implication of this is that if you don't know what you're doing, you'll, you'll, you'll have a mess. Okay, so you have to somehow uh, think uh, very carefully about what, what you do with your DAG. Hopefully you, you arrive at a state where you have this ordered highway, everything's clear, a large throughput, a good utilization of your DAG. And if you're very lucky or very uh, thoughtful, you can arrive at a protocol which also has fast confirmation times, at least for some, some transactions. And this will be uh, the topic of this talk. Okay, so to wrap up the, the, um, the preface of this talk, scaling up blockchain uses, using DAGs uh, opens up various uh, cha challenges. So the, again, the first one and the main one would be consistency rule. But once you solve that, you have to also address confirmation times, storage, how, how much storage do you want uh, miners or full nodes to, to, to store and for how long. So think of a thousand transactions per second at least 86 gigabytes per day. Do we want everyone to store this forever or not? Uh, these are kind of challenges we are, we are addressing. Fee structure, fairness, how to maintain decentralization, etc., etc. But in this talk, I wanted to, to focus on just one challenge, and this is how to utilize the DAG uh, fully so that the entire throughput, or at least um, we are close to the entire throughput that the DAG can supply. So I will show now why this is not a trivial um, challenge. Okay, so we have two scenarios for a DAG. Let's say we have, um, imagine many blocks per second, let's, but for simplicity, let's say we, we are two miners in the system just for a moment. Uh, you're miner one, I'm miner two, and we have four transactions to confirm. So I'm creating my block, you're creating your block, and we are unaware of each other's blocks because this is in real time, 10 blocks per second, there's no time to, to coordinate. And there's, there's two scenarios here, right? The, the first scenario, the less optimistic one, is the red scenario where you selected TX1, TX2 from the mempool, I selected TX1, TX2 from the mempool. And what happens in this case is because these transactions are not conflicting, they're just a duplication of the same transaction, then no harm was done in the sense that these, both of these transactions are approved by the system, by the DAG. However, we wasted space. Okay, so uh, two, tra two transactions, TX1 and TX2, took the space of four transactions over two blocks. So this is just a, a very simple example. And of course, the optimistic scenario, the green scenario on your um, left-hand side would be that you somehow uh, selected TX1, TX2, and I somehow selected TX3, TX4, and now we have a good division of uh, four, four transactions covered a spot of four um, transactions in the block deck. And the main question of our research here is how do we make sure that we are closer to the green area than to the red area? Namely, let's, say, let's assume we have a good block deck protocol that has a good consistency rule. How do we make sure and under what conditions the DAG is utilized and transactions are not merely duplicated across chains? Okay, so this is the main research question and just to have like, to the, the first proposition of this research is if you don't do anything, if you just let miners mine greedily or naively the top transactions that they see in their mempool, then the DAG gains nothing in terms of throughput. Okay, so what you see here is a simulation results, just a simple setup um, generated by Yoad, my colleague. So what you see is the green curve is the throughput of a DAG. Under a naive, greedy uh, mining policy where every miner selects the top transactions from the mempool. And the yellow uh, cur curve represents a chain structure under this in, with the same parameters. And you can see that the chain throughput and the DAG throughput are almost identical. So if we mine naively transactions into blocks, DAG uh, gains us nothing in terms of throughput. It does gain us in terms of confirmation times, but I won't touch it now. And of course, these, you can see that these two curves are very far from optimal. We can gain much more by, uh, the DAG can ha has much more capacity if we were more wise 
and use more sophisticated schemes to coordinate between miners. Okay, so here's the good news, and perhaps the, the main thing I want to, uh, message to uh, this main message I want to convey to you is that miners are incentivized to some extent to avoid collisions, to avoid transaction duplication, and to contribute unique transactions and increase the throughput. So this is a, 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 a natural incentive of miners to, uh, to contribute to the healthiness of the system. And w the reason is simple, because if we collide on the same transaction, if we both choose the same transaction for our blocks, then the split will, will need to split the fee between us. Right? So you will get half of the fee or, or some other portion, I will get the other portion, but we can't pay the fee twice. Right? So if some user said, I'm, I'm willing to, to, to pay one mil of Bitcoin for my transaction, and we both embedded these transactions in our block, then only one of us will get a transaction, or maybe we can split it, but, but we won't be able to, uh, to extract from the user two, two mil of Bitcoin. So there is some incentive in the system to, to coordinate and to avoid collisions. So this is the good news. And, and now we're heading to a, for a more formal a treatment of this problem. So I hope the chicken game is, is, a, is known to at least most of you. The chicken game is a, is a very famous uh, game to model conflicts. So you have two parties uh, uh, driving towards each other and uh, heading on collision. And the first one to swerve and you know, chicken, chicken out, is the chicken, and the, the one to uh, stay right ahead on track is the, the deer. And of course, if, if, uh, if, if, uh, if I deer and you chicken out, then I win, vice versa, you win. But if you both deer, then there's a collision. Not good. Um, so the inclusive game, in the DAG transaction selection game, is quite similar. There is some difference which I won't touch on now. But it's quite similar, right? We have a TX1 to, let's say we have a TX1, TX2 in the mempool, and one of the transactions is, is more expensive, TX1. It's, it pays us, let's say, two, two millibitcoins, and TX2 pays us only one millibitcoin. And now we need to decide how, how to, let's, uh, the numbers should be different. I'd say TX1, three, three millibitcoin, and TX2 uh, would be two millibitcoins. That would be better. So. If we both uh, select TX1, the most high paying transaction, then we will collide and we, need, we will need to divide the fee between us. But if we both um, select TX2, we need to divide a lower fee between us. So we have to coordinate somehow to select trans to, for you to select TX1, I will select TX2 or vice versa. This will be the optimal setup. So in the game theoretic um, um, terminology, you have the table, the matrix, of payment to the, system, to the players, and every cell corresponds to one scenario. And strategies in this game, this is an important point, you have in game theory pure strategies, which is simply which transaction to select, and you have mixed strategies, which is using randomness to select transactions. Okay, so uh, in, a, in a mixed strategy setup, I can toss a coin, and using the result of this coin, I will decide which transactions to select. And this is the well-established fact in game theory that using randomness, we can achieve much better results for all players. Okay, so what this uh, practically means is that um, we are looking at a setup in a DAG where miners will randomize over the mempool to select the transactions for their blocks. So whereas in Bitcoin, a, a miner simply um, selects the top uh, transactions for its block, in a DAG, we will have a, a situation where the best thing for you to do is to randomize over the mempool um, according to some probability di distribution and use this to uh, maximize your throughput. Okay, so how do we solve this game, this, this chicken or this inclusive game? Um, as common in game theory, there are several approaches, um, economic uh, agendas, how to uh, approach a game. So the, 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 the top um, left, um, scenario is that there's serial setup where you're a mining pool and you're paranoid and you think everyone just wants to sabotage your, your profits, everyone just wants you to, to, your revenues to drop. And in that scenario, you have the safety level solution, which essentially means I just want to guarantee myself 
the best response against everyone else that wants to sabotage and lower my profits. Okay, so this is quite adversarial and uh, it does not fit the uh, loving Bitcoin community. So we, we might consider more, more cooperative setups. So the selfish setup is the more common one. This is corresponds to the famous Nash equilibrium model where every party pursues its own interests, but somehow the invisible hand uh, gain, uh, brings us into equilibrium uh, under which no one uh, gains from deviating. Yes, so, so this is um, a common concept. There's also a very interesting uh, equilibrium concept invented by Robert Alman. He's a novelist from the Hebrew University. And this is a correlated equilibrium, so still everyone is selfish, but we have some signal that enables us some coordination. So in uh, terms of mining, you can think of a signal as the randomness from previous blocks. Right? So perhaps we can use the randomness from previous blocks to select more wisely transactions to our mempool. So this is a, a hope, um, one hope for our research. And then there's the, the most altruistic setup where everyone is playing just for the sake of, of, um, of the healthiness of the system. Uh, seriously, you can think of it of Bitcoin's early days as a setup where the only concern of everyone was to maximize social welfare. So we had uh, minor mining pools um, confirm zero, zero fee transactions. Why? Just to maximize social welfare. There were less incentives back then. Okay, so we can visit several of these ideas. There won't be time to, to revisit all these solutions. But let's, let's begin with the maximum social welfare. This is the most simplest and also the most optimistic and um, sort of kind atmosphere solution. So, what's, so what would be the maximum social welfare? Let's, just, let's say all the miners are cooperative. They just ask us. Uh, we, don't, we don't know how to coordinate, but please design a mechanism under which uh, the, the DAG is utilized and we won't collide and we will increase the throughput to the maximum. So actually the solution in that, in that uh, case is rather simple. And the instruction to the miners will be um, just select a transaction un in random in a uniformly from your mempool. Um, so let's say you have uh, six transactions or of course yeah, you can have thousands. Um, you, you just toss a fair coin between them until some threshold and, and you accept all transactions uniformly. I won't touch to the, the threshold is simply what's the capacity of the DAG. You can't, you can't of, of course, overcome this capacity. And it's, it's a very famous and very simple result from queuing theory that says, that, that implies actually that you won't have any collisions in the system. So the, the buckets, the transactions will be um, sparse enough that collisions will be very negligible. So essentially you have a maxima, maximally utilized DAG. So again, the take home message here is, if everyone's cooperating, the best thing, the, full, the, the way to utilize the block DAG optimally is to select transactions uniformly. But of course, this is a bit naive. And what's the catch? So there's two catches. First of all, this is strategically unstable. We are assuming everyone's uh, uh, interested in maximal social welfare. This is not always the case. But moreover, there's a more inherent problem with this approach, and this is, and this is that it does not allow for differential uh, service to, to urgent transactions. So I can't um, prioritize transactions. As a user, I'm, I'm unable to signal to miners, you know, I really need this transaction fast. I'm willing to pay more, just put it in there. I won't be able because they would just pick uniformly from the mempool, and I will wait for, for a long time. So what you see here is everyone waits the same time there are some transactions um, here on, on the um, left-hand side area, which are never approved, but, but all those that are approved wait the same time. It's very egalitarian. And you can think of it in the terms of a highway where everyone is stuck in the same traffic. Okay? And you're not sure, as a system designer, that that's what you want to achieve. Okay? You are more... Um, opt to choose a system where there are expressed lanes. And expressed lanes simply allow us, for some people, to say I'm willing to pay more. Um, I know there's like the 
taking more riders, but assume there's a payment for the express lane, at least in some areas. So I'm willing to pay more in order to, to get to, to work fast, et cetera. So that's a more healthy design of a system. And then will you have this curve that says the larger you pay, the, the, the faster you get inside. So this, this is a one uh, thing you want to design a system according to. And there's a nice trade-off here, which is um, um, unfortunate or inevitable. I always like Thomas Sowell's um, quote, uh, there's no, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. So um, what's the trade-off here? If you have high utilization of the DAG, if you, if you avoid collisions, then essentially you can't serve these express lanes you can't have uh, prioritized transactions because you, you have to signal trans uh, to miners to back off from these expensive transactions in order not to collide. So this is, uh, this is on the one hand, on the one end. And on the other extreme, um, if, you, if, you allow for, um, if you allow for fast confirmation times, you will inevitably suffer from collisions. So what you see here is simply the function of how long um, how, the number of collisions of a transaction as a function of, the, of, the, of its waiting time. And you see that only transactions that allow themselves to wait a long time in the buffer suffer no collisions, whereas transactions that want to be confirmed fast will be confirmed by various miners in parallel and will suffer collisions. Bottom line, shorter waiting times for transactions, or at least for pr priority transactions, implies more collisions and less utilization of the DAG. And this is inevitable, and we need to trade off it uh, wisely. Okay, so, so with this, let me um, go on to describe uh, uh, the, Nash, the Nash equilibrium solution. So what happens in real world when we have this chicken dare uh, uh, state, st um, state of affairs? So the, the problem here is, is intractable, so usually in these kinds of games, Nash equilibrium is computationally hard to find. But the spirit of the Nash equilibrium would be something in, in the form of, if I see you cooperating, then I will cooperate. But if you are greedy and you always pick the highest paying transactions for your blocks, I will retaliate. And I will sabotage you and I will also be greedy and pick the highest paying transactions until you back off. So uh, I apologize for the militaristic um, um, tone. But this is a tit-for-tat uh, known strategy. There's a family of strategy, K tit-for-tat. Um, and it's very interesting to understand how, how mining pools will, um, will behave. So just think of a uh, you know, mining pool as long as it's not anonymous. If it's anonymous, then of course, this is the, the question mark I put here. If the mining pool is somehow hiding its identity, um, then it's, it's much, uh, it's, uh, we're skeptic about whether you can, you can penalize. You can penalize maybe everyone, but this, this becomes real, very intractable, even intuitively to understand what happens. But, but in a world where mining pools do not hide their identity, then if a mining pool really will be greedy, then the community of other, at least of other mining pools, will, will start uh, sabotaging this pool by colliding with its transactions. So it's a very interesting game theoretic um, framework to think of this, of this situation, and also of a general situation in the world, um, this chicken there, uh, scenario is not, is not unique to, to mining block DAG transactions. Okay, so I said it's intractable to, to compute the, the Nash equilibrium. So we did a more modest, we achieved a more modest goal, namely we computed the Nash equilibrium for the single shot game. We only play once. What will be the Nash equilibrium? We have a nice formula. I won't go over it now. But the good news, okay, so just maybe the qualitative message of, of the Nash, you can see here that we pick um, high paying fees with high probability. So if a user wants us to, to, to embed his transactions very fast, we, uh, he, will, he will put a, a large fee and then we will use, we will all sort of collide, but not, not necessarily. You can see that the curve does not reach probability one. So even if I'm paying a high fee, no one will be too greedy to pick it with, high, with, with certain probability. So this is a good um, feature of the system. And more good news for you 
is that Nash performs quite well, meaning the utilization of the DAG under a Nash equilibrium, so even if everyone is selfish, the utilization of the DAG is not bad. So not bad here means around 72% on this, on this graph. Um, so 70% of the DAG contains unique content, unique transactions. So it, it's a very surprising result. You, you could have thought that if everyone were um, selfish, then you know, we will revert back to the greedy scenario. No, you won't be, you won't be greedy if, if, even if you're selfish because you want to randomize over your mempool in order to avoid collisions. Very good news. Um, but still, maybe we can improve the utilization a bit more. Um, another interesting graph that we must, we must um, talk about is <clears throat> sorry, um, the quality of service levels. So as I said, um, the problem with the maximal social welfare solution is that you can't prioritize transactions. So what you see here is the tall gray bars represent the maximum social welfare strategy. So everyone waits equally the same time uh, and a very long one. And then the blue bars represent the Nash equilibrium where you approve less transactions, so only transactions with a fee uh, from three here, three millibitcoin and on. The precise numbers do not matter, of course, it's just a, a dummy model. But as you, as you increase the fee, you wait less. We want, we want this feature, right? We want um, uh, high paying transactions to pay less. And we have other uh, uh, strategies, the exponent strategy. And if you can discern the yellow bars, um, the very little ones over there, they say if everyone's greedy, then you will only approve a very small set of transactions from 4.3, et cetera. So this is a good, um, a good, um, illustration of the problem or the challenge. Two more points. First of all, correlated equilibrium. Um, as I said, perhaps with coordination between miners, we can achieve better utilization than Nash. Um, and the, the coordination would be using previous blocks randomness. Okay, so instead of tossing a coin um, with the Nash probability, we will do something more sophisticated. And pre preliminary results, results show that indeed we, we, can, we are able to utilize the DAG, the DAG uh, better. Um, but this needs to be um, more investigated. And last point is a general point about scaling and incentives. So selfish mining in Bitcoin, selfish mining is a known strategic um, uh, attack on uh, deviation from the mining protocol. And in Bitcoin, this attack is really sophisticated. It's risky. It only works in the long term after two weeks at least. And so arguably, the reason we didn't see selfish mining in Bitcoin till now, or at least not in non-negligible amount, is because playing with your mining uh, node just to withhold your blocks and risking losing it all is too risky, and miners won't engage in such a behavior. Unfortunately, in a DAG, deviating from the mining protocol is much more uh, available to you. You just need to select transactions in a certain way, or withhold your blocks for a few seconds, recall that everything is integrated into the DAG, right? So if, if I'm withholding your, my block and you created two blocks, then I'm not, I'm not discarded forever. So it's a very, it's a much more granular decision how to optimize my mining protocol, and the risks are, are less for the miner, but also the result, the harm to the system is, is marginal, relatively marginal. So this is, um, an important point, and also lazy selfish mining. So I have a pool that, let's say it, it adheres to the mining protocol, whatever it is, but it doesn't uh, uh, invest in communication infrastructure. So it has a low bandwidth de deliberately or just by laziness. It doesn't propagate blocks fast enough. So what's the effect on the, on the network? Again, this, this pool may, may not uh, lose too much profits and other miners might be harmed. This is a very, interesting topic for us, so we are investigating it. And to wrap up, when implementing block DAG protocols, incentives really matter. So again, in Bitcoin, one block per 10 minutes, things are, are pretty robust, at least in the mining, um, at least as you stay in the same chain. Um, but in a DAG, things are very sensitive, and with that, I will end my talk. Thank you.
Hello? Ah. So thank you. Uh, we are over time. Um, so bad news, no time for questions. Good news is we're going to break for lunch, and uh, we're going to have Anthony Towns up after lunch. So come find Anton if you've got questions for him now. Uh, lunch again is outside here. There is a cafe over by the bathrooms. And uh, we'll resume at 1.30. The switching off. I uh, uh, hold on a sec. That's. Hey, that looks good. Uh, this right changes. It uh, changes. Uh, yeah. Yep, that's that's it. So just uh, control L and uh, that works. Okay, let me close this. I think this is. This is it. Oh, there's still redesigning the consumer market. Okay. Okay, uh, food.